What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skyland, and you probably know me from my work at Free MMO Station, because I love free-to-play games, and you might know me from my free-to-play top 10 list. Well, I've got here my first season, all compiled together. We're going to montage it together, and you're going to find some awesome free-to-play games if you happen to miss some, or, if, hey, if you're new here, then you might want to go and just, I don't know, peel your eyeballs open for this, because it's going to be a long video that is just going to force-feed all this awesome free-to-play content right into your brain socket. So, hopefully you enjoy that, hopefully you have fun with these games with the videos. Hey, remember to keep the hype alive with a like and subscribe, and I'll see you again next time. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylint, and today I'm going to show 10 games that are niche, that are free, that are new, that I think you guys should try out. I know they're not for everybody. However, this collection of games, maybe you'll find something that you'll stick with. Maybe you'll just have an experience. Actually, I implore that you play any, all of these games because they will leave an impression on you. They will leave you with something, okay? Uh, good or bad, I don't know, but I think that they're all worth at least trying because they're freaking weird, okay? And me, I'm a fan of uniquities. Literally, my slogan here is that we go into the nooks and niches of the gaming market and communities. We try out new stuff and share it, and that's what it's all about. So this is a top 10 that really exemplifies the stuff I'm into, and hopefully you guys can explore that with me. So let's do it. Top 10 new niche free-to-play games. All right, guys, first up, we got Gloria Victus here at number 10. Now, the game is actually pretty in a rough state, I would say. I uh, Well, compared to many in the genre, it's actually pretty freaking awesome, but it's not quite free to play yet. You still have to buy into it. It's still early access, and I mean, it's it's early access, like literally, okay? So a lot of the functionality of the game is not polished, and there's actually just like a lack of functionality in many aspects. However, the core concept there being this sort of low fantasy uh, faction versus faction, open world PvP sandboxy type of thing, it's actually pretty cool. A couple other games have been trying to do it. A couple other MMOs do exist. However, I feel like Gloria Victus is actually our best bet, even in early access. Even though I have, you know, played through it and I've seen its roughness, I really actually still believe in the production of this game. I feel like it's actually going to go places. So that's why I'm saying it here. Yes, it's not for everybody. And even to the people that do like the genre, there are competitors that maybe are technically fully released. But no, actually, I think I'm keeping the hype alive for Gloria Victus. Now coming in at number 9, we have Battle Right. This is a MOBA that just completely focuses on the battle arena portion. Some people would call this genre the brawler genre, or brawler MOBA, or multiplayer online brawlers. Anyways, so it's just 3v3 or 2v2 or 1v1, and it completely focuses on the mechanics of character versus character. Now, there are rounds, and in between the rounds, you actually do get traits that kind of enhance your gameplay, but overall, it doesn't have itemization. It doesn't have the normal MOBA map, and it's really, I, I can't stress this enough, incredibly mechanically intensive. So fighting games on PC already pretty freaking niche. But then put that into like the MOBA genre, which is already competing with like League of Legends and stuff like that. So to people who actually enjoy this game and really dive into it, yes, there's definitely some uniquities. But to a new player, it's going to seem like it's kind of falling in between two worlds where there's just a whole lot of competition already. But I'm going to ask you guys, dive into it, check it out. There's a whole lot of goodness here in Battle Right. Coming in at number eight, we have Tiger Knight Empire War. Now, this is going to be for the player that's a little bit more of like a history buff or maybe somebody who really likes to fantasize and theorize about mixing and matching different armors and different unit types and seeing how that actually uh, stacks up in a historical sense, but not really. It's definitely still a game. I don't know. People who like World of Tanks and World of Warships will actually probably fall in love with this game as well, even though mechanically, seemingly and aesthetically, it's very different. I think actually in the end, the, the overarching like gameplay is very similar to those games. It's, you know, big team battle, slower pace more strategic the customization and monetization is actually like identical to world of tanks and overall like the mixing and matching of units and the literal rts mechanics because you can actually send out your different units in different places is very much in line with something i would expect from that genre of you know the world of series so if you're really a fan of those kind of things but you kind of want a little bit of a mountain blade-ish kind of mechanics to the game because you do actually control your commander and of course in a medieval setting i think that this is the fantasy that you want to go and play Coming in at number 7, we have Faria, which even in the tactical CCC genre, which I've, I've already done a top 10 just on that genre, a Faria is really special because tactical CCGs focus on board play. However, Faria is the only one that I've played where you actually build the board as you play it. So it's definitely just a little bit more special. Also, I really appreciate because you build the board and it's board and land mechanics, which is something like basically if Magic the Gathering had a literal board you play on, then that's kind of what Faria would be like. That actually changes around a whole lot of the deck building and mechanics. And overall, since CCGs are about deck building, I feel like Faria has some of the most unique decks that you could possibly make. A lot of different gimmicks, a lot of different strategies and tactics. And I really appreciate Faria for that. So yeah, the whole board, you know, building gimmick 
it's more than just the gimmick. However, at the same time, it separates it greatly from other tactical CCGs, makes it maybe a little bit more niche, but to me, a little bit more special. Next up on the list, coming in number 6, we've got Scara the Blade Remains. Now I played this back in like press access pre super pre alpha and it was extremely rough, completely unplayable. However, it's come a long way from where it has been. I think it's still pretty rough around the edges, but it's trying to do something unique and interesting. Now, I have played actually a couple of other games that are in a similar or branching genre such as Archblade. There's this game called Chronix and actually I could just list and list and list tons of games that you have no idea what I'm talking about because this genre of like these 3D team brawlers, or I don't even know what you would call it. I mean, it almost seems like a MOBA like Battle Right, but the camera angle change does impact the gameplay a lot. And I don't know, this this whole like MMO Battleground-ish similar genre is just something that's uh, very unheard of. This is incredibly niche, and Scar itself is still not very popular, even though it's probably the most popular of the genre, especially because it's just now releasing. So I don't really know what to say about this. Think like Soul Calibur if there's teams, maybe? It's kind of like that, and I really want to play these games. However, it just kind of happens that not many people play these games. For one reason or another, I don't know, but Scara is probably the best one to bet on. Halfway on the list, we have a game that I actually put in my top 10 2D arena shooters, and that's going to be Awesome Knots. So Awesome Knots being a 2D side-scrolling platforming arena shootery MOBA is definitely very niche, but uh, also the fact that it wasn't free-to-play. It just now went free-to-play. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a big reason why it wasn't very popular. I mean, it, it was known. I mean, it is a known awesome game. Awesome Knots is pretty awesome, but the thing is, is that it cost kind of a, a good chunk of change for comparatively what it was and, you know, the MOBA genre as a whole. So even when I had press access to go actually and play during the giant expansion, new characters and stuff like that. I actually had trouble finding matches, so hopefully it's not too late to go free to play like a couple other games that happened recently. Hopefully now people can jump on and see the charm and see the character and the love in this really weird game, but it, hey, it's a really good weird game. All right, guys, next up on the list, we have the Secret World Legends, which is something of a relaunch for Secret World. It's going free to play as well, and it's supposed to have an update to a lot of the mechanics. Mainly, I think the combat is getting a revamp. So Secret World was a game that I was like extremely excited to get into. However, I didn't because the gameplay just didn't really jazz with me since I was a big fan of like, you know, the free roam and explosivity of World of Warcraft back in the day. Uh, however, I think with the Secret World Legends and now my more mature taste in action RPGs, I think I might appreciate it a little bit more. Now, it's really niche because it focuses really more like, I know it's an action RPG, but it really focuses on the RPG. I actually put this in my top 10 RPG MMO list as number one because it's really more of like a role play and diving into these communities as a player and an avatar and a person all combined and really exploring these stories. It's a very storied game. And it's very interesting and intricate like that. However, the combat update, maybe more people will play it, more people will try it, and maybe I and you, and maybe we can all fall in love with it. All right, coming in at number three, we have Fractured Space. Now, this slot was actually competed for by a game called Cloud Pirates, as well as a game called Dreadnought. However, I feel like Fractured Space is the one that I really want to put on this list because it's the one that really pushes forward that the nichities, <laughs> the uniquities, really pushes forward that World of Tanks in space kind of gameplay where it's really strategic, really slow paced, and it has just a tremendous amount of customization, requires a tremendous amount of team play, and just other games that are coming out don't quite emphasize that enough. So you have Dreadnought, which is a little bit more uh, kind of dogfighty. Cloud Pirates as well, even though it's airships and has a really unique aesthetic, is actually very similar to Dreadnought. And then you get into genres like War Thunder, which is straight up dogfighting. So this really slow three-dimensional flying or aerial combat, you don't quite get it to the extent like you do in Fractured Space, and that's simply why it made the list. Coming in at number two, we have Quake Champions. This is a game that I've covered extensively and I enjoy and I'm gonna continue streaming and I like it and I think it's really cool. And really, like the numbering on this list is kind of arbitrary because I'm ranking it based on quality, but at the same time as uniquity and normally those things don't quite go hand in hand. Uh, but however, Quake Champions is a cool game. However, it is more or less like half the same of what Quake has always been and it's it's very arena shootery. A lot of people are gonna be like, yo, that's Quake. I mean, it's got champions, but it's still Quake. So overall, in terms of uniquity, you know, I mean, for the arena shooter genre, it's, it is actually very special. Adding in these characters and how they work mechanically with the game is pretty special. It does change the game, but it's still an arena shooter. It's still Quake, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, it's a pretty awesome game. I very much enjoy it. I like what they're trying to do and they're striving for new things with a genre that's really freaking set in stone. They're trying to carve out a new path. I appreciate that, but I know some people also won't. They don't really like the changes. And some people think that the changes more, ch and some people think that more changes should have actually occurred. Maybe be kind of like myself, I think that maybe we could have some different weapons that aren't a decade old, but hey, that's why it's only number two.
Number one, we have Snow. Now, you can actually go click the link in the description to see my first impressions on all these games, the videos, uh, relevant top tens. Uh, but Snow is a game that I really just, I dig so much, man. I know that there is Steep, that is a competing game that's not free to play. However, I feel like Snow has some very special things that I could just go on and on about, which I literally do in my first impressions and multiple videos I've done on the game. Uh, but this is a game that is just, it's so chillaxed, okay? It's a snow sport, free to play, open world, kind of sandboxy get little game. I, it's weird, okay? Like, it's an extreme sport game, but at the same time, it doesn't really feel that extreme. It's not just in your face, whoa, boom, pow. It's it's more kind of slow paced, and there's a lot of little tiny intricacies to the mechanics of the game that can make the game really awkward, but at the same time, there is a lot of playability if you can get past that initial hurdle. So I will warn you guys about that, and actually many of these games on this list, there is gonna be an initial hurdle of, whoa, this is really weird, I don't know if this is for me. Just try it, I promise. It will leave an impression on you. Thanks for making it to the end, guys. I had a lot of fun putting together the list. I had a lot of fun playing the games, and hopefully you do too. I just want to say I really appreciate you guys, and I'm glad that you appreciate me appreciating these games, and hopefully we can appreciate it together cyclically. Uh, that'd be really fantastic. Give a like, subscribe, share this on Reddit, and stuff like that. You know, the video. Get, get the gospel out there. Okay, guys? It'd be really fun. Uh, this channel's new. These games are newish, and the whole point is, is to meet new people and have new experiences. So I kind of need you guys to make this work, and hopefully we can continue having fun. My name's Skylint. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome friends, today we're going to be talking about the top 10 free to play MMO. Right, so my name is Skyland, I like playing MMO, but I have to admit, I haven't played every MMO to end game, but well, some games that I truly do enjoy playing, as casually at least, is going to be the free to play MMO market. Not just MMORPG, okay, this list is going to be a little bit more eclectic, but we're going to really focus on that free to play component, okay, because that's kind of what I specialize in personally, and even then, still, haven't played all these games to the fullest extent, so this is going to be a community effort. Please let me know in the comments below what you guys think and feel, but for what I know and understand, these games can be experienced without spending any money, okay? You can actually grind and earn everything playable in all of these games, hopefully, kind of. If I'm wrong, please let me know. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so if you want some really good MMO content for free, you know, this is it. This is the list. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first game I'm going to suggest you play is going to be a very niche title, and it's a game called Star Trek Online. So if you are a fan of the shows and the movies, then this is probably going to be your game. In fact, you might not have known that the game actually expanded to Xbox One and PlayStation 4. It's really flying under the radar here. It's not that bad of a game, and you know, for its age, it's pretty freaking good. It's just like five years old or something like that. But anyways, the game is getting consistent updates. It's got a really nice, tight-knit community, and a lot of people who play MMOs are really in it for that community effort. So a game as niche as this even though it might not be as massively popular as others, is actually doing really well for itself, and I think you owe it to yourself if you have any hint, you know, a, a glimmer in your eye at all for the universe of Star Trek Online, because hey, actually the story of this game is a little bit canonical, or at least it follows the canonical story, then yeah, you should at least try this game, because again, it's free. Next up on the list is going to be a very similar situation, and that is going to be The Lord of the Rings Online. Yep, another niche title that's focused completely on a very hardcore fandom, okay, here. So it's going to be The Lord of the Rings Universe. If you're a fan of the books, maybe the movies, then yeah, you're, you're probably going to have a good time. You're going to fit right in here with this community. But I do want to kind of touch on the free-to-play factor for Lord of the Rings, because there, there are expansions and updates, I do believe. But I believe also, very similar to Guild Wars 2, you earn that sort of premium currency through playing the game. So eventually, if you wanted to really like be dedicated to playing free to play then you could eventually unlock everything playable in the game just from yeah playing the game so lord of the rings online as an mmo exactly for every reason why i kind of you know praise star trek you're probably gonna enjoy this game Okay, so next up on the list we have Rift. Now this is a game that I don't have too much experience with myself, so please let me know if the end game is worth it. All I know is that there is a very awkward introductory stage to, uh, you know, this MMO. And as a free-to-play game, it seems uh, very welcoming, I do believe so. It's just that, you know, for me personally, it just didn't fit my taste. I think this is going to be a game that is going to be kind of polarizing to a lot of people, not just because of, well, in previous games that we talked about, you know, their fandoms. It's just that we've kind of seen a lot of the stuff that it does in other games. However, you know, all those things are pulled into this game, and so if you yourself get pulled into the game, you'll have a wealth of things to do even as a free player. Yeah, you can do everything in the game apparently, so that's pretty neat. But I will say again, it kind of resembles some other games. Most directly, it was uh, competing with World of Warcraft at the time. Of course, we saw what happened. It fell from grace and went free to play and now has it reclaimed some glory. I know it's not a bad game. I don't know if it's for everybody though. Please let me know in the comments. 
All right, guys, so next on the list, we have a two for one. I believe that neither of these games really deserve a single slot on this list. Uh, I think both of them are amazing games as a whole, and their free-to-play content that is specifically made for free-to-play players that kind of limits them, that content is also uh, like very, very generous, I think, and very good. But this is a list about, you know, playing and living inside of these MMO worlds and these communities for free, you know, persistently. Now, both of these games do offer options in order for you to actually play their expanded content or, you know, their subscriptions service, uh, you know, unlock the future content, you can do that as a free-to-play player through, you know, in-game currency exchange. But at the same time, these games don't make it very easy to do that at all for a free-to-play player. They give you very specific restrictions as a free player to limit your gold income, which is what you kind of need in order to purchase the subscription service in RuneScape and the gems in Guild Wars 2 to upgrade to the expansion. So because of that difficulty, I'm not going to put these games very high on the list. And in fact, I'm just going to put them both in the same slot. I think this is going to be a good point for contention and controversy yeah in the comments below but uh i don't know i like both of these games and they do allow you to play for free technically so let's hash it out in the comments below yeah, yeah, now following that, uh, let's talk about Arc Age, a notoriously pay-to-win uh, free-to-play game. So Arc Age is free-to-play, though. You can play all of the playable content, you know, mechanical content that you can actually enjoy and consume. You can do that for free. However, I think that the debate comes from, uh, you know, the fact that the game is pay-to-win. You can actually get things that boost you as a player, that, that give you bonuses. And because it's a sandbox game, because it does have this, like, ecosystem and, you know, there, there's a lot of, like, intricacies to Arc Age that um, it makes it kind of awkward and really hard to sort of justify putting it on a list like this, but I think since it is also a sandbox, you can enjoy it in a number of different ways, and like I said, technically you can experience all the content for free, it does belong on this list. Maybe not so high, but it does belong on this list, and especially for first impressions as a free-to-play player, it's fun, but to continue to um, stay and sit in this community and enjoy it with everyone else, with this whole pay-to-win thing hanging over your head, it might be a little bit dubious, but still, it's at least worth checking out. All right, now halfway on the list, we have a game called Planetside 2. Yeah, you can actually play this for free on PlayStation 4 as well as PC, but Planetside 2 is a game that I kind of have a little bit of a history with. Um, I actually made a couple of videos talking about it, and every time I did like a review or a re-review, first impression, whatever, um, I felt like it was kind of grindy slash pay to win-ish. Now, technically, I know it's not pay to win, but it is a PvP game only. It is an MMO FPS. Original, yes, really cool game. You're not going to get another experience like it anywhere else, free to play or otherwise. But the thing is, is it throws you in with like all these other players and you know there's all these vehicles all these classes all these weapons the customization there's a lot to do but it's kind of gated behind a tremendous amount of grind and so since it is directly pvp and with that grind added in you are going to feel kind of not very good as a free-to-play player i know myself i was forced in order to play a specific role with my group of players i had to spend money to unlock a certain item so that then i could you know fulfill my role in the group not everybody's experience is going to be like that i'm just saying that's you know that that feeling that vague you know, awkwardness, that sensation of inferiority that will permeate your being as a free-to-play player. That's the reason why it's not higher on the list. Next up on the list, we have a game called Blade and Soul, and I just want to say from here on out, there is absolutely nothing wrong with any of the monetizations in these games. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about the games. Blade and Soul, dude, it's a, a kung fu fighting MMO. Now, I think some people will not enjoy this game. It really depends on your ping. If you have good internet, good ping with the servers, then you're going to have fun with this game. I mean, of course, also, it's, it might be a little bit niche because of the art style. It's also a six years old game that was, uh, you know, meant for a completely different audience entirely, but it finally came to the West and I think it looks good for its age. I think it plays well. Again, it's just really about that that latency, okay? Because it is a kung fu, and it really feels more like a fighting game, okay? I mean, it is an MMO, but it's like a fighting MMO, okay? Based on combos, and you really need to be accurate with, you know, precise with the timing, and that's really the only thing that I can say about the game. Um, it's really more of like, a, I guess, there's two halves of the game. You have the hardcore arena PvP, and then you kind of have like the story, you know, the, the cinematic story, which is pretty good, and then, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of dungeons, but you really play this game for the PvP, and luckily, you know, that's completely fair and balanced if you have good ping. Number three on my top 10 list is going to be Wildstar. I put it pretty freaking high up because honestly, I think it deserves the spotlight. Wildstar is a game that launched as a AAA boxed with subscription game, okay? So lots of money was poured into this and would require of you to actually participate in the game. It was supposed to be focused on end game rating and it still kind of has that niche. It is, it does have a little bit more of a difficulty scale toward the end of the game, which is pretty hype, honestly, but that directly contended with World of Warcraft in art style, in gameplay. It was really trying to pull from that. So that's really wild. 
why it, it kind of failed there, which is really tragic, honestly. But Wildstar now actually has a very worthwhile amount of content to play through, and it's all completely free. It's just kind of like cosmetic, aesthetic, and just, you know, quality of life kind of stuff if you want to, you know, spend money on the game. But entirely wholly, Wildstar is a great game, especially if you're looking for something that's similar to World of Warcraft, but with a little bit more, I guess, bite to it. It's a little bit more action-based. A story of David and Goliath, except this one didn't turn out so pretty. And coming at number two, we have a game called Terra, which is an action combat MMORPG that focuses on end game group content, very similar to Wildstar. And I'm not actually putting it higher than Wildstar on this list. Like a lot of these games can actually be, you know, swippity swapped all over the place. It doesn't really matter. But Terra and Wildstar, they're so high on the list because they focus on end game content. And that's really where a lot of people, they, they people who are looking for lists like this, they want to know what content, what games can I explore and play for free and, you know, truly enjoy and immerse myself in these communities in Wildstar are and tear up being hardcore end game games that allow you to play the end game and constantly expand on it for free yes they're gonna be high on the list so yeah Terra is basically very similar to Wildstar in a lot of ways um but aesthetics completely different and it's it's called action combat it's actually more similar to tab targeting than a lot of people would be comfortable admitting but if you play certain classes and play certain roles and whenever you're fighting certain bosses it really does feel maybe something like an action RPG like Dark Souls it can feel completely different at times so yeah guys I just want to say depending on whatever aesthetic taste or biases you have Terra could be an amazing game. All right, guys, my number one is going to be Trove. Oh, yeah, man. Dude, I love this game. I absolutely love it. It's a casual game. It does not focus on end game rating or anything like that. OK, and there's really no expansion or, you know, there, there's no like actual limiter for new free players or just new players, period, to have to be like purchased to actually enter that. No, the game is completely focused basically on that like early game content on the early casual leveling experience, you know, just trying out new classes constantly, consistently, like going and doing new things, going to new areas, but not exactly like going further out and, and, and doing like, you know, the end game, which is locked away somewhere and you have to go through all these loops or something or eventually pay money. No, that is not the case. Trove is a lighthearted fun game. In fact, I seen Ashley put it as a number one on her casual MMO list. I completely agree. It's a very fun game to jump into, jump out of. There's really no weight. There's nothing on your chest and no sort of despair at all. Like there's nothing in the game that really incentivizes you to spend money except for cosmetics, really, and get, getting those faster, actually. So yeah, you don't feel any sort of tension or incentive to actually purchase anything or spend money immediately when you start the game you are already in basically the meat of the game you're already deep inside what the game is trying to offer you and you're already having fun and so for that I put it at number one all right, guys, I just want to say thank you very much for watching my newest top 10. I do a lot of these. I try to do them daily, try to get them out. I really love sharing the love, sharing these games and my love for them, and hopefully yours too, yeah? Community effort, like I said. So if I'm wrong about anything or if there's anything I missed, or, you know, you just want to add on a little bit, you know, tell us your experiences, you know, it'd be pretty cool, pretty fun, then, yeah, do so in the comments below. So, guys, keep the hype alive. Thumbs up, comments down. My name's Skylance, and hopefully... I'll see you around. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylance, and today we are going to be talking about my personal pick for my top 10 upcoming free-to-play MMORPG list. Been playing MMORPGs for basically all my life, okay? Professionally for five years, okay? With free MMO stations specifically working over there as freelance. So you might think that I have an eye for free-to-play MMOs, but I've also played a lot of them. And I know there's a lot of bullshit out there, but I think that these are probably our best bets, even if some of them aren't the greatest bets, right? Okay, so these are the most unique games, and each one kind of offers something different and special. And hopefully that you'll find something on this list that'll be fun and enjoyable for you. But then again, remember, guys, they're going to be free. At the same time, though, they're upcoming. We don't quite know how MMO they're going to be or how good or polished or yeah, all that good stuff. Intro aside, let's get into the top 10. All right, so Period Chronicles. I want to talk about this game first. Uh, and by the way, the list is completely unordered. I'm just throwing it out there, okay? Pretty casual stuff here. Period Chronicles, though, is looking really good. And I think that this is just complete bias for me, honestly. But at the same time, in, in my top 10 list, I really have to put it here because there's not really that many good free-to-play games coming out that are MMOs. But Period Chronicles, regardless of if it has all the features that it planned, which is truly ambitious, I doubt it's going to have everything, but just the way it looks, okay? I love anime. I'm a big anime fan, okay? And a game that looks as good as this with its graphics and, you know, the little pretty anime particle effects and the shading and everything, the cell shading, oh my god. It just, it looks so good to me. Now, that's my bias. Then again, I could just list off all the different features. That's, it's, it's really ambitious. I don't think they're gonna have all of them. 
But uh, there's like this Pokemon style, you know, uh, kind of combat system. It looks pretty explosive. It looks fun to me. And there's supposed to be this really cool like town customization thing going on. I don't know how all the different monsters are going to be, uh, how many monsters. I don't know how the customization is really going to work in the end because it's been having some development issues, but it just looks really good. That's, that's all I can say. That's why it's on the list, guys. Okay, so another game that looks really good, but at the same time we've seen extensive gameplay from it, and I think they're gonna really nail this game, is gonna be Lost Ark. I don't think anybody is really doubting if Lost Ark is going to be a decent game. The only problem that I think a lot of people have with Lost Ark is the cash shop. It is a Korean game that is mostly action RPG. Don't get me wrong though, it is still gonna be an MMO. Like, it's still gonna have MMO aspects, it's still gonna actually have an, an overworld that you can explore, even though it is very dungeon focused, though many MMOs are. Lost Ark is going to be a, an MMO action RPG, which is uh, kind of revolutionary, almost a little bit actually. Uh, but Lost Ark looks so good, like graphically, mechanically, it has so much going for it. I love all the classes, they seem really unique. I mean, of course, you got your spin to win class here, you got your, your default, you know, mage over here, but the way they all are utilized and all the extra stuff that they can do is really fantastic. So, yeah, I think they're all the different classes and the class customization, how it works in this game is going to really take the front and the cake. I don't know, that, those, those dungeon monsters look pretty fucking epic, too. All right, next game is going to be a game that's a little bit more low-key, actually. It's called Eminence Xander's Tales, and I put it in a recent top 10 for crowdfunded games. Yeah, this has actually been a crowdfunded game. I mean, it was just, it was lightly crowdfunded, not super duper high, but this is going to be an MMO CCG, and I know we just had a video talking about, can any game be an MMO if it's popular enough? No, I don't think so. I don't think, a, like, you know, Hearthstone is an MMO because it's popular. But the difference here is that Eminence is, like, actually, there's an overworld. You have a character, you go explore a world, it's just the combat system is, it goes into, like, a little, you know, instance, and you guys, like, you play, like, a little card game thing. And it actually reminds me a lot of, uh, I don't know if you guys ever played Final Fantasy VIII's or IX's card game thing. It kind of reminds me of that. So, really interesting uh, concept here. As a CCG, it seems unique, but then as the overall concept, they actually go around and travel the world as an MMORPG and, you know, interact with other players you know, trade cards and actually steal cards from beating them, that sounds super hype. Next game, let's talk about Bless Online. Now, Bless, I really wasn't looking forward to. I mean, I thought it looked good. It kind of reminded me a lot of Final Fantasy XIV. Like, this seems like it's going to be, you know, the free-to-play Final Fantasy MMO. But uh, the fact that they're willing to actually revamp their combat system, which also is actually kind of similar to Final Fantasy, uh, makes me very, very excited. Okay, normally... Free-to-play games tend to be budget games. They tend to be, but Bless Online actually seems like it's taking an initiative and is trying to make really probably maybe the best game that they possibly can. It seems like, you know, they, they made a they made a first rendition of the game and during the betas and during the tests, people said the combat was just a little bit slow. Everything else was it looked good, it played good, and Bless Online is actually like, okay, every night, you know what? We'll we'll make it a little bit better. We'll make it a little bit more action-packed. You want some action? Let's go. Let's do it, fam. And so that's what's gonna happen. Uh hopefully, hopefully that is. Okay, there's still an upcoming list. We don't know what these games are gonna turn out to look like and, and be like in the end, but Bless Online is definitely one of those contenders that could be freaking amazing. Well, now, 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 let's talk about Glory Victus. And I really, what I want to say right here is Glory Victus will be free to play, guys. I know it's in early access. And you know what early access means? It means it means that you can access the game early if you spend money. Sometimes it's free to play, sometimes it's not. But Glory Victus will be free to play when it leaves early access. It's just right now, it's in early access. You spend 20 bucks. Now, do I, do I recommend that you buy it now? No, I, I don't because Glory Victus has a long way to go. But I've played it since literally they gave me press access. And back then, that was really, really rough. It was bad. It was really, really bad. Honestly, I gave it, I gave it a thumbs down when I played it then. Yet, I still didn't have a horrible time. It was just really clunky. However, the game has come so far, and I've put it on every top 10 that I possibly could have since then. So, yeah, I, I really feel like I want I want you guys to know how I feel, um, and I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about Glory of Victus um, compared to a lot of the other games in the genre, like Life is Futile. No, I think Glory of Victus is going to be the one, guys. Okay, Maple Story 2. Now, I don't actually know how Maple Story 2 is going to really be, okay? Like I, I, we I don't even know if it, if we're going to get it properly in the West. I I don't know. Maple Story 2 is a really weird game because Maple Story 1, I mean, a lot of people will say it's an MMO. And it's a very social MMO, I guess, but it's also very action RPG. It's very instance-based. It's it's very dungeon crawly at the same time. But Maple Story 2 is 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 it going to be like that because like the graphics look totally different. The gameplay looks totally different. Um so I I don't really know what to go off of. Like is it going to be a proper MMO? Is it just like a bunch of instance mini games? Um either way, it's being published and kind of like proclaimed and advertised as an MMO. So I'm going to say, "Hey, Maple Story 2 is an MMO." 
MMO to look out for. But at the same time, are we even going to get it in the West? I don't know. And what are we going to get when it comes to the West? I completely don't know. All I know is that it looks cool and it's got a pretty big uh, lineage, you know. So, yeah, the history of Maple Story 2 is enough to speak for itself, I think, to be put on a top 10 list for free to play upcoming MMO. You know what I'm saying? All right, next up, we have a game called Lineage Eternal. Lineage Eternal now kind of scares me. I haven't played it yet, and uh, I think it's it's definitely directly competing with Lost Ark, okay? So, but Lineage Eternal is doing some weird shit, okay? If you don't know, actually, Lineage Eternal is going to have a party system, and what I mean by that is that one character will control, I believe, three different characters. And I've only ever seen this in, like... I don't know, tactics style RPGs, and I've only ever seen it in one other action RPG, and that was called LEGO Minifigures Online. And in that game, it was actually really awesome, okay? And I think a lot of people are going to just overlook that, or, or maybe become biased and be like, oh no, I, I really just want to play my one class, I don't, I don't really want to do that. Dude, I promise you, this is going to make Lineage Eternal very unique, it's going to be very special. And I think uh, the PvP in this game is actually going to be really, really exciting as well. It's going to be weird. Now, I think the only other MOBA that has character switching or any other game ever is a MOBA called Master Master. Uh, so I, I've played that game. I've played Lego minifigures and I've played a, a lot of tactics games. But real time games with hot swapping characters is weird. It's different, but I've played those games and it has worked for me personally. Maybe it's not going to work for you, but I can say that it's going to make it kind of interesting and unique. Now, how MMO-ish is Lineage Eternal? I really don't know. It's supposed to be an MMO, but then again, you know, marketing and everything. Uh, Lost Ark, I know, is going to have a proper overworld, but is Lineage? I don't know. Either way, it's going to directly compete with Lost Ark, and really, my bet is going to be on Lost Ark. But still, Lineage Eternal, it seems like it's trying some weird shit, and I kind of like that. I, I appreciate that. Okay, Dark and Light, guys. Dark and Light, Dark and Light, Dark and Light. This game, what used to be a game, it used to be a game, and it completely failed. And it had like dinos and stuff, and it was like a it was like a fantasy arc thing. Anyways, and basically it's being remade, and it's just it's supposed to be like in a new engine and you know revamp mechanics, and it's just supposed to be overall better. But a lot of people are really disliking a lot of the trailers, and it seems like the overall mood of Dark and Light is that this is probably a cash grab of some kind. This is this is I mean obviously the trailers l look kind of good like graphically, but like it looks cheesy as fuck. And maybe hey maybe that's its gimmick, dude. There can there is some cheesy. Dude, Ark itself, Survival Evolved, is cheesy as fuck, and yet it works, dude. So Dark and Light, it's it's actually more cheesy because it's more like a fantasy like Ark, but it's kind of it's supposed to be like an MMO. I don't actually know how MMO it's gonna be, but it's yeah a fantasy Ark sounds pretty hype to me. I guess a lot of people are talking about it for better or worse. We'll have to see. Okay. Now next is Sky Saga. This is gonna be pretty much for debate here. Uh, how like. I guess how immersive Sky Saga is, how MMO it is, how RPG it is, because a lot of people look at it and think that it's just Minecraft. And you can kind of actually play Sky Saga like that, sort of a little bit, sort of. Like you can actually just, uh, you can make and build your personal island, you can kind of create mini games, you can create like, you know, castles or like a personal house. Um, you can kind of do that, but in order to do that, you need to go on adventures. And normally, I would consider this in an action RPG genre, but it's incredibly social, it's incredibly online. And even though the whole world, like, unlike Minecraft, the whole everything is separated by instances, but those instances are open instances. So, if I could describe it, it's kind of like Guild Wars, actually. Like, Guild Wars is highly instance game, but most of the time, you just kind of go back and forth between the instances, and people are, you know, jumping on, like in Sky Saga, you're jumping into these islands as other people are persistently playing these islands. So so even though there, there are loading screens, it kind of actually works like a sandbox game. And in fact, I believe I put it on my sandbox MMO list pretty freaking high. So Sky Saga is, has a lot of charm to me. The PvP is actually pretty hype too. And unlike Minecraft, the combat is actually pretty legit. I've done a lot of jumping puzzles. I've played a lot of player uh, islands with the mini games. I've, I've jumped into these dungeons as well and played with other players. And there was a, a nice little level of difficulty, even for a childish looking game like this. And there's some really interesting mechanics with dual wielding or using a bow. And I really want to see where they go with the quest because the quest system is pretty hype as well. I just want to see where this game goes. They've been taking the betas and the testing very seriously. It's been in, in development for a long time and I just really wanted to rain on Sky Saga. So if that's cool, cool. Lastly, let's talk about Revelation Online. I say this for last because I have the least to say about this game. I played, I did my first impressions, I rage quit the first day, came back the second day, played it a little bit longer, and I started to kind of appreciate the beauty of the game. Uh, there are some scenes where there's some fucking flying whale going through the air and then crashes into the ocean, and there's a lot of uh, kung fu stuff going on, and there's a lot of really cool mechanics, okay? Like, if you just look on on paper, there's, uh, like, you know, I guess 100 versus 100 world open battle things. Um, people are going to be fighting over giant, you know, monster spawns in the world, you know, guild versus guilds, because they want to they wanna fight for the monster loot. 
Uh, and that's cool. Those are, they're supposed to be giant monsters all around. And But the story is really cheesy. Maybe it's supposed to be like that. Maybe it's lost in translation. But overall, Revelation Online looks like it's taking ideas from, like, aesthetically, Blade and Soul. Um, mechanically, a lot from World of Warcraft, actually. And overall, it just seems like a bunch of games that you've already played just kind of mashed into one. Maybe that could be good if you come into it with a little bit of humor. You know, a little a comical sense of, like, oh, this is such a gamey game. It's such a, you know, MMO. This is an MMO. Like, like, it's so obvious that it's a game. It's so arcade. But sometimes, that could be really fun. I know personally Black Desert's like that actually. It's very arcade, it's very aware it's a game, and that's okay. So Revelation Online might surprise us, but right now, eh, I don't know. Anyways, friends and family, that's gonna be the end of the list. That's all I really have to say. Hopefully you enjoy the casual nature of the list because I really don't like, you know, just, just copying and pasting, you know, from Wikipedia or some shit, you know, just like, oh, this game does this and that. No, I really like to kind of give my real thoughts and opinions from my experience of playing lots of free-to-play games. And also, this is a big thing, analyzing publishing material, okay? So there's certain games, they do certain gimmicky things to make it seem like it's a cool game, you know, Ashes of Creation. And it's just, you know, it's just marketing. It's just kickstarter e, you know, language. I want to see what games are actually going to have substance or whatever, and I think that the games on this list have the best chance of actually having substance. But still, there's a whole lot of, you know, markety bullshit. At least I played some of these games, uh, but still, they're upcoming. We don't know everything completely. However, these are your best shots at having a good time if you want to play a proper MMO or free, okay? Anyways, tell me your thoughts and opinions. If there's a game I missed, leave it in the comments below. We can talk about it. Open the discussion. Open the gates. <laughs> That is the comments floodgates, man. Uh, I think it's going to be a good times. Anyways, thanks for, uh, you know, having me, guys. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you guys have fun yourselves. My name is Skyland, and I'll see you in the next one. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skyland, and today we're going to be talking about the top 10 best free-to-play co-op games you can play right now. These titles are, of course, completely free. You can jump into them with a friend or two and have a blast. That's why I love free-to-play games, because it's so easy to play with friends, and these games are designed specifically with playing with friends. Oh, boy! Co-op. Yeah, exactly. Now, the ranking and overall the list is my personal opinion, so if there's a game that you want to give a shout-out to, something niche, something weird, something small, or just something that maybe I just completely missed, absolutely throw it out there in the comments below. I would love it. And if you had fun with the list, remember to give it a like. Thanks. That would be awesome. All right, let's go. Top 10 free co-op games. All right, guys, let's start the list by talking about Orcs Must Die Unchained. Now, I only played the PvP version of this game, and apparently that is no more. I guess the community said, no, we, we kind of want what Orcs Must Die 2 had, you know, a little bit of co-op, a thing that's really where the franchise should be heading. And so, yeah, I guess the developers were like, okay, we'll listen to the community. Let's do a co-op free-to-play game, which is pretty rare, actually. This list uh, houses really, I think, the only co-op games, truly. If I miss some, please let me know in the comments below. But still, Orcs Must Die Unchained is newer. It's sitting at mixed reviews right now, probably because of the transition from PvP to co-op. But overall, when I played even the PvP version, I thought it had some really cool ideas, some interesting traps, and overall the game feel was very interesting. I love the design of the game. It's very cartoon, very comical. I think it's a cool game to just jump in, and there's lots of different characters to play as and utilize, and so different team compositions can play differently, and you, you can have different traps and things like that. And uh, all in all, man, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this game. Let me know your thoughts below as well. Next, we have a twofer, guys. I have a game called Cry of Fear, and I also have a game called No More Room in Hell. So these are two different games, though they might look a little bit similar, because they're actually inspired kind of like from the same kind of genre, as well as uh, you know, the actual mod. They are from mods of Half-Life 2, I believe. So Cry of Fear is a modded game that turned into a full game. No More Room in Hell, same thing. Um, and they also appeal to the same type of gamer, and they have the same type of mechanics, kind of, where ammo, super, super limited. Um, they're horror games, they're very dark, they're very gritty. They're kind of a little bit glitchy, too. Uh, but like basically you need to aim your shots the games are really more crawly more uh, you know actually slow paced uh, you have to go scavenge for materials and you have to really you know take care not to waste bullets and stuff like that it's very tactical it's very slow paced but it's uh, it has that creeping horror type of feel now we're no more room in hell is more um, kind of swarmy and more like zombies where cry of fear is a little bit more there's freaking giant monsters that'll kill you in one hit so there may be less monsters and it's more paranormal more ghosty and stuff like that so depending on you know what you're going for uh, these games are both mechanically similar. Um, maybe you should just try them both, yeah? And let's talk about another two for here. We have Dragonest and Vindictus. Now, unlike our last entry, these games actually are aesthetically very different. And the mechanics vary just slightly, but they're basically sister games. I mean, they literally are sister games, sorry. Uh, Dragonest and Vindictus, both published and de designed uh, very similarly here and developed by the same company. Uh, Dragonest is more of a cartoon and comical type of aesthetic, as you can clearly see. And it's more about air juggling, and uh, the combos, I would say, are overall a little bit bigger. Or Vindictus, it's like um, a little bit 
bit more down to earth, if I dare say that, but it's still ridiculous. It's a lot more bloody, uh, almost I would say horror. In fact, I added it into my top 10 horror um, free to play games because I think that overall with its animations, its bosses and, you know, the aesthetic, it is actually kind of horrific. So yeah, they're both action RPGs. They're both amazing dungeon crawlers that have a tremendous amount of content. Some people will call these MMOs because they are massive games. So if you want a co-op experience that will last a lifetime, okay, just a really long time, these two games, these two sister titles are definitely the action RPGs to try out. And next on the list, we have a game called Alien Swarm. So Alien Swarm is pretty self-explanatory, top-down, waves or swarms of aliens come and try to kill your faces. I actually want to mention, though, uh, that this game is an open uh, source SDK, so you can actually, like, mod and stuff to Like, this is pretty interesting, because it was a bunch of modders that were hired to Valve to create this game, which then allowed this game to become moddable. So, really, there shouldn't be, like, a proper end to the content. Like, you could always make more if you want to. And I know, for me personally, when I was a kid, whenever I had map maker tools and stuff like that from Halo Forge or Far Cry or whatever, man, I would always love making maps maps and you know having my friends play with me and do that you know have a cooperative or competitive experience but still so this is going to appeal to that kind of player but also if you just want to jump in and have a really fun light time alien swarm man it's just super self-explanatory jump in get swarmed have a good time Next, we have a game called Warframe. Now, this is going to be somewhere uh, kind of similar in the vein of, like, Dragon Nest. It's really, really long content, okay? So, it's massive content. There's a lot of dungeons procedurally generated. There's lots of content to be had, you know, lots of different frames, which are the characters that you can play as to unlock and utilize. And so, this game, normally, I try to stay away from MMOs because it is very hard to cooperate with MMOs. And I feel like that's a whole nother list, whole nother genre of game, like, you know, party systems. But Warframe is a really tight dungeon diver, as in there's only four players at any one time and it really feels good as co-op there's there's like so much to do in this game i really can't express that enough but warframe is really just kind of known for the same reason that dragon and vindictus are it's just swarms of enemies hordes of enemies really and you're just you know you're a space ninja slicing through them it is a lot of fun uh, but what makes this also kind of higher on the list is the fact that you have kind of like a max cap for different frames so if somebody's new is coming to the game then you could just pick up a new frame and then you know join in with them because part of the process of warframe is kind of re-leveling new frames new weapons over over and over and over again so you're constantly playing with new players and so it's easy to actually uh, more easy i would say the versus dragon s of Indicus, to actually play with new players because it's like incentivized in the game anyways yeah space ninjas dude pretty much it right <laughs> All right, coming in halfway on the list, we have TF2, Team Fortress 2 here with the man versus machine game mode. And I think a lot of people have this misconception that TF2 has really died out because of Overwatch, but uh, no, TF2 actually has so much to offer. If it's mini games, um, you know, with all these different servers, if you just want to play casually, and I'm a little bit competitive now, but Team Fortress 2 still has a tremendous amount to offer overall. But cooperatively, I feel like the man versus machine mode is what keeps me playing the game. It's incredibly hardcore, actually. It's very hard, and there's uh, so much room that that you like for uh, playability you know you have these items that you can equip for your different characters um you have like every wave you get currency you use this currency to kind of level up your character which is totally you know out there for the game it's totally ridiculous uh, and you can do some really fun things with your with your team compositions you know your team as a whole you know different strategies and tactics and overall all the different maps they have a lot of variety and um, the bots are actually really fun, they're really smart, it's a really challenging game mode overall. And I think a lot of other games kind of just, they do tack on, you know, Horde Wave Survival. But for Team Fortress 2, to me personally, that is my main focus of the game. Fantastic, absolutely love it, can't recommend it enough. And next we have another Valve game, Dota 2. So Dota 2, I mean, it's a great game. I would put it higher. I normally put it on number one on the list because I love its monetization scheme, its gameplay overall. It's just super high quality. And really, I, I like to hit home the fact that it has custom games. It's got a custom game, Finder as well, and Matchmaker, which is great. And a lot of those custom games are actual like full-on cooperative campaigns or they're like Wave Horde Survival. And there's a plethora of them being created every single day. And they are really fun and really good quality. You think, oh, we want you play one horde survival you played them all but when you have such creative tools and such freedom like you do in dota 2 with your characters as a player and also as a creator as somebody who can make all these weird rules around all those weird abilities and stuff and you know all those monsters and creeps and it just it gets crazy it gets ridiculous and yes it is different every single time even if you're playing the same little mini game so yes dota 2 i know it's a competitive game but i'm also going to rank it as one of the best free-to-play cooperative games 
know. I think it's about time we talk about a game called Unturned. I put this on a lot of lists, and I think that it's it probably isn't overshadowed by much. I think really H1Z1, you know, Daisy, the more serious looking games gets talked about more, but Unturned is still incredibly popular. It's one of the most popular games ever, and it looks so cheesy and cartoony, but I love it. So Unturned is kind of a competitive game because it is that like open world zombie survival and there's other players and some servers have PvP enabled, but still this genre is still very cooperation focused, okay? And if you want to, I especially want to mention this because it's really friendly for children. Also, it's one of the few free to play, um, you know, survival games that actually is good for kids. So if you want to play a cooperative game, well, you know, with a child or somebody younger, which is often the case where people who are looking for these kind of lists, Unturned is that game. It's incredibly fun and you really need to utilize each other. You know, uh, maybe somebody's holding, you know, certain uh, items and, you know, maybe they need a bandage. So you go bandage them or you give them that or, you know, you go out and you kind of uh, you're searching or salvaging a vehicle. You bring it back um, and you save them by mowing down a horde of zombies that are around them and you, you know, the, you get away. And I don't know, man, there's just a lot of really cool cooperative scenarios that can happen. And even if you throw in the player versus player element, that can also be seen as very cooperative. Uh, you have to, you know, form teams and stuff like that. So I don't know, man. Un Unturned is a a, a very different kind of cooperative game because it's not ho just horde survival it's not just a campaign it's a little bit more open-ended but i still wanted to put it on the list because it's just freaking good dude Number two is going to be Path of Exile. Yeah, no, Path of Exile is pretty great. As a single player game, it is really, really great. Now, I only did the first campaign and a little bit of the very first expansion, um, but I'm actually going to be covering like all the game here really soon. It's just tremendously great. Now, as, as a single player game, everything is voice acted. The story is engrossing. I thought the world was really dark and brooding, but there was there was still like this charm to it. Like there, there was like a lot of really good stuff to the basically. I want to say it's almost perfect. I think a lot of people would say that it's it's like, you know, a spiritual successor to Diablo. Blow 2, you know, in a lot of ways, um, just like everything is great. I, I think a lot of people would consider it the best action RPG and every other action RPG, even Diablo 3 is really compared to Path of Exile, not like the other way around. So absolutely fantastic, a tremendous amount of customization, uh, but if you play co-op, you're gonna have all that fun. Plus think about the customization with the characters and how you make your classes. You guys can make yourselves kind of build off each other and really use that, you know, that cooperation. And dude, there are just hordes of enemies that you need to slaughter through. And that's just always fun with a buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But if you do want to play a single player, an amazing game as well. And lastly, we have Dungeon Defenders 2. Dungeon Defenders 2, I have it as number one because I loved the original Dungeon Defenders. And I played a good bit of Dungeon Defenders 2, and I have, I'm having a lot of fun with it too. And I'm going to be streaming that and doing a full review pretty soon here. But um, overall, yeah, if you want to pay for a good co-op game, Dungeon Defenders Original is, oh my god, I would probably put that as my number one for paid. But for uh, free to play, Dungeon Defenders 2 is also freaking fantastic. You have lots of different characters, and it is a tower defense type of gameplay, but it's also actiony, very actiony. Um, some characters play wholly different while others are sort of slight variations. Um, but yeah, some characters focus on different kinds of towers. Some don't even use towers. They use traps or ores or weird stuff like that. And some are more focused on the third person, you know, kind of like action. Some are more like third person shooters. And uh, some characters can play like literally like an RTS, at least in the original. So it's just really fun to have all those different characters and they play against, you know, with each other in a cooperative setting, you know, horde, survival, wave survival, tower defense thing. Um, you know, it's got lanes, monsters and bosses and all that good stuff. And overall, I would probably rank it as the best tower defense game ever. It looks great, it plays great, I love it, and also it's uh, kid friendly too, which is a big bonus for a co-op list as well. Yeah, some games are level oriented or campaign oriented, some are open ended like Unturned, and some are Horde Wave Survival, a lot of them on this list, and I think that genre is amazing for co-op. It's really made for co-op, or co-op inspired it really directly, and I think that uh, this game specifically is the epitome of that genre. Thanks for watching guys, that's the end of the top 10 list, but there is more to be had actually. Well, in the future I'll be making more top 10s of course, and expanding on this list even, and in streams and videos and first impressions. Always playing new games, and I love me some multiplayer games. Free to play? Heck yeah, co-op? Heck yeah! We got that coming also. But hey, look in the comments below, I'm sure there's a game I missed. I know there's Mari Zero, it's a little bit older, it's a little bit more niche, and it's kind of a fan game, but still, that's a pretty cool free to play co-op game you might want to check out there. But yeah guys, please stay subscribed, and, and keep the hype alive with a thumbs up to share the video, especially if you liked it. You you know you might want to like the video and uh, also subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff because we do have a lot of cool stuff coming top tens or otherwise hope you guys had fun my name's Skylint and I'll see you in the next one hello friends welcome to my channel and welcome to my top 10 my name is Skylint and today we are going to be talking about the top 10 upcoming free-to-play games that you probably haven't heard of now honestly I'm not shading any of these games it's just that they all focus on a niche so it's completely unsurprising that they haven't blown out in popularity they're all pretty weird they all focus 
focused on a very specific type of gamer with their very specific type of games. But saying that, I know that they're good. I know that they're fun. I like playing them. I have played every single one on this list. You can probably find my first impressions somewhere on the internet, and I definitely think they deserve a little bit more attention than what they're getting. So I'm hoping this video gets some eyeballs in their direction. Hopefully you guys find the games to be intriguing enough to try them out. If you can, soon or later, whenever, just give these games a chance. Guys, I did and I had fun. I don't regret it. And I'm hoping that maybe it'll be the same for you guys too. And starting our list, we have a game called Forza Horizon Apex. This is a free-to-play racing game by Microsoft Studios. Check it out, it's gonna be on the Windows Store, guys. You gotta get that in the Windows Store. And don't worry, Windows Store overall is being updated. It's being handled very well, especially from back in the gigantic days or when Killer Instinct first came out. They also have Halo Forge Hub coming out pretty soon here. So a lot of really cool free-to-play games coming out and AAA games coming out. And especially if you've heard the announcement that a lot of Xbox games are coming to PC through the Windows Store. Really exciting times for Microsoft. And these games are no joke. They are not knockoffs and they are not unpolished. The Windows Store as a whole and every game inside of it has been seriously really cool. It's very refreshing and specifically with Forza Horizon, even though the whole series is kind of a console seller for Xbox, they took this leap, entered the free-to-play racing market, which honestly was kind of filled with a bunch of shit games, and they entered with what could have been just a mediocre game and they put forth their best foot and it looks like a really great game. And it's one of the great starting additions to the Windows Store and I'm so excited to see what Microsoft has in store for us coming next year. Next up, let's talk about Unreal Tournament. Now, in a lot of top 10s, I definitely try to mention Unreal Tournament because seriously, more people need to play it. But honestly, the arena shooter genre as a whole doesn't have too many people playing it because it is very particular and it takes a whole lot of time investment and it just kind of, it needs a lot of people to really exist. And otherwise, you're just playing with the hardcore players and you're just gonna get constantly destroyed. You're not really learning that way. You're not really having fun. But Unreal Tournament is a little bit different. One, because it's actually free to play where a lot of other arena shooters, even Quake Live stopped being free to play. You're not free to play anymore. Now there's a couple that might switch to free to play. Her Toxic might have a free to play version, but Unreal Tournament is free. Plus it has community tools so that you can actually create fun little mini games and stuff like that. So you can jump into Unreal Tournament and actually kind of not play Unreal Tournament. You can go play in some other random custom game or something like that. But Unreal Tournament as a whole, it's a really cool game. And if you do want to focus on that particular hardcore competitive, you know, actual tournament sort of gameplay, you absolutely will have that with the backing of Epic Games. So Unreal Tournament is pretty freaking good. Next up on the list, we have a game called Revelation Online. Now, if you do like specifically play MMOs, then you probably have heard about this game coming out because there's a little bit of hype train kind of starting to roll with this. However, at the same time, there's a lot of people that don't know about this game because it's just kind of out there. It's Eastern influence. So especially if you're in the West like me, then maybe you're kind of, you know, hesitant about this game or just you don't really fly in those circles. So you don't know about it. Uh, but Revelation Online is going to be an Eastern inspired game. It's very wushu kind of in a way, like it's very Kung Fu. It's going to be kind of bleeding soulish, especially the way it looks. It's like anime inspired, but at the same time, it's like very much more so a kind of focused, like the percentage is like 70% realistic and maybe 30% cartoon. But I feel like it's kind of this weird mixture and merger of Western philosophies and not just art style uh, and also Eastern mechanics and, and culture. And it kind of in the end blends to be like a Terra game, but like much, much faster paced. A lot of really cool Western action RPG concepts being thrown in with a lot of Eastern art style and graphics and aesthetics. Could it work? Who knows? Let's find out when it goes gold. Next up, we have a game called Cross Out, which offers a little bit of customization, but a whole lot of impact versus the huge amount of customization that we have in Robocraft and the no amount of customization that we have in games like Twisted Metal, Vigilante 8, stuff like that. So it kind of harkens back to those days, but still gives you just a little bit more, a little bit extra customization. Now the customization is decent. I very much like it. You don't need the block by block customization that Robocraft has. That's what Robocraft does. This game gives you a little bit more explosivity, a little bit more with physics and stuff like that. That. Uh, however, of course, you're gonna miss out on, you know, giant robot legs and jumping spider healing tank things, but it cross out is a little bit more down to earth, a little bit more grounded, but still being just kind of insane and awesome in its own way. Definitely an aesthetic that very much reminds me of Twisted Metal. So if you liked games like that, but want a little bit of customization and in a free to play game, then yeah, you're gonna want to play cross out. Number six is Gigantic. Now, I think a lot of people were hyped for this game, but then kind of forgot about it. So I'm actually unsure if the general public knows about Gigantic or not, but I'm pretty sure that if they did
did, then they probably forgot about it. Gigantic is a good game, and it's probably going to become a great game with all this time and support that they're getting. And now that they're partnered with Perfect World, it's not just relegated to the Windows Store. It is still apparently going to Xbox One, which is really nice, and it's also going to be purchasable and playable through the Arc Store. A lot of people don't like the Windows Store, even though it's getting better, so that's pretty good. Just a quick recap for those who have forgotten what Gigantic is. It's essentially like a MOBA, but take away the towers, make the towers monsters. And then instead of just lanes, it's more like one lane. You have these, of course, giant bosses that actually push down the lanes and do all this crazy stuff. It's like raid bosses, man. And the general aesthetic is extremely cartoon and fast paced. It's almost like if Overwatch was really more focused to be a MOBA and a third person shooter, and that's really what is gigantic. It's completely frantic and fun, really awesome customization, very Heroes of the Storm inspired customization with abilities and leveling, but the overall pace and the game feel is just unmatched so far, especially in third person shooters, especially in MOBAs. I know we got third person shooter MOBAs kind of like Smite and Paragon, but trust me guys, Gigantic is a whole nother beast. Halfway through the list, let's talk about Ember Strike. Now this is a genre that I never play. This is a puzzle fighter thing. However, the game is actually kind of mechanical in ways. You have to have reflexes, like whenever you do big combos, you get these points and use these points in order to use ultimate abilities, but it's not just any one character ultimate ability. You have multiple characters that have to mix and match, so you, so you gotta actually have strategy with making your team. And then whenever you're mechanically solving the puzzles, you have to quickly react to enemies like shooting at you and you shooting at them. So it's a puzzle fighter in the truest sense. And this is really flying under the radar, like completely, probably because of the type of genre that it is, but it's a really good game even on PC. I did my first impression. I was completely blown away. I was ready to just shit on the game. And um, honestly, I was really uh, fantastically surprised that it didn't seem pay to win. All the characters seem really fun and original, the colors, the polish. And even though it's a genre I never play, this game made me want to play it. Let's get some more peepers over in that game, check it out and giving it some more good reviews. Coming in at number four, we have a game called Fractured Space, which gained a little bit of traction during a time when a lot of space games are coming out. And I think a lot of people were uncomfortable with the type of gameplay that it was. They were introduced to it in an awkward way, uh, I think very probably. You have games like Star Conflict, which is like a dog fighting game in space. And then you have games like Dreadnought on the Horizon, which I just played, which is actually kind of similar to the Fractured Space, but a little bit faster paced, smaller maps, stuff like that. Um, and then you had like these space MOBAs, which really didn't work out. And then you have Fractured Space, which in my opinion is essentially World of Tanks in space. Like if there was world of spaceships, this would be that game. Now, this is a game I'll have to admit that I don't have too much time with, but at the same time, it requires a lot of time to really get into it. And I think that's the niche it's really focusing on. If people who like to be strategic and tactical with their teams and building and customizing their different uh, compositions with their teams and the composition of their actual spaceship and then jumping into the game. And a lot of people who want to have mechanical dogfighters are gonna go play other games like War Thunder or Star Conflict. But for the crowd that this game is aiming for, I think it's ideal. Here's a game that I think a lot of people feel very strange about. See, Atlas Reactor was going to be free to play, and I actually did a first impression on free MMO station about this game, and I was kind of, you know, interested about it. But then it went buy to play, and I did a first impression over at Attack Gaming, and as I reviewed it as a buy to play game, really wasn't that enthralled. But now there is a free to play version to get introduced into the game, and then they have these sort of buy to play packages, which is actually very reminiscent of how Paragon is working and how Smite works. So I think that's, you know, probably the best way to do the game. It should definitely be free to play. Uh, but, you know, with that flip flopping and just the way the game has been advertised, it kind of started flying under the radar, people started forgetting about it, and it just kind of lost the spotlight, which it barely had in the first place. So this is a tactics game, but instead of controlling a crowd, a group, a party, it kind of works like a turn-based MOBA. That's essentially what it is. The arenas are extremely small, there's not really any objectives, it's straight up like team deathmatch, uh, but it's a tactics game in the truest sense. Every character, it, it works in turns, and they have this weird phase system, but in the end, I think it's gonna garner a very hardcore crowd. If you kind of like the concept of MOBAs, but you really like tactics games, and you always wanted to play like an online tactics game with a party, then really this is the only game that fills that niche. And it actually looks really good. At number two, we have a game called Orcs Must Die Unchained. This is a pseudo MOBA type of game. Now it's very inspired from its predecessors, obviously, but it's mechanically different, absolutely. Aesthetically, and a lot of the mechanics like placing traps and just how you control your character as a third person shooter, that, that all works, right? But instead of it being PVE focused, kind of like Dungeon Defenders, it's like Dungeon Defenders PVP, uh, in a sense that you're actually setting traps and down these different hallways, and I guess you can call them lanes almost, because it's kind of MOBA-ish, and then you can actually summon different creeps. The creeps don't just naturally come out, you actually pick and choose which creeps that you want to spawn as a player on a team, so you have all these creeps going down these different lanes, and you have all these traps that you yourself are customizing, and you build your own card deck so that you have your own unique set of traps, and you have your own team composition with different characters and different abilities, so it's like a MOBA, but it's like if Dungeon Defenders, or I don't know, if Orcs Must Die was a MOBA. So I think that there's a little bit of disconnect with the original players of the original franchise, but at the same time, even though there is that disconnect and it's been flying under the radar, I think it's a really cool game in its own unique right. Now, the final game that I want to talk about is a game called Snow. Now, there is actually a couple
couple of games coming out in the distance that are directly going to compete with Snow, but personally, I really think I'm going to be the one appreciating and loving Snow. Snow, as a free-to-play game, even right now in its early access state, is completely enjoyable, and it will offer you hours of entertainment. Now, the game is trying to focus on realism, but it's still going to put you at the very top of some really ridiculous mountains, and you're going to go on some really ridiculous jumps, and it's going to feel amazing. Now, what's really cool about Snow is that eventually we're going to get different snow sports included in there, like I mean, snowboarding. Yeah, it's not just going to be skiing. We can also customize our different downhill areas, like you can put ramps and stuff, kind of make your own park, and really get that MMO experience, because yeah, this is actually an open world game. You're actually in open worlds, and you're doing these open lobbies, and you're actually doing these open events and stuff, so really excited to see where this game goes, but even if you play right now, it's unfinished, and yeah, there's bugs, but still, it's actually a really cool game, and I definitely already poured hours into it, so wanted to mention that, and this is actually the game that got me to even make this list. And that's the end, friends. Yeah, the top 10's over, so I guess you can leave now. I just want to say a word to the developers of games like this, and these specific games. It's like, I really appreciate what you do, guys. I know not the mass market is not going to love it, maybe, potentially. Most people might not, but you're focusing on a niche. You're trying to do something just a little bit original, maybe something that's out of your comfort zone, or really out of the comfort zone of everybody, and just trying to experience something new. You know, you yourselves are trying to develop something new, and consumers get to experience something new and weird, maybe, or different, and it's just, it's not for everybody, but that's kind of what makes them good at the same time, and I appreciate it. Me, personally. Maybe maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm a dungeon diver when it comes to weird niches in the gaming market. I like to dive in there deep and then find the treasure. And guys, I think that these games are the treasures. I'm sure there's some more out there. Please tell me what treasure you have found in the depths of the internets and share it with us, please. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Skylint, and if you want to keep finding treasure with me, then like and subscribe. I'm here every day, and I'll see you, hopefully, again next time. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylant, and today we're going to be talking about my pick for top 10 free-to-play PlayStation 4 titles. Okay, so they're free, you jump on, and you play. It's as easy as that. These are games that I have, I've played every single one of these games on PS4 or on PC. Now, some of them aren't actually out on PS4 just yet, but I have played all of these, and I absolutely recommend you try them all. Even if maybe you actually play it on a PC, because some of these work completely, perfectly fine, and are cross-platform with the PC on PS4. All right, guys, so if you got a PS4, there is absolutely zero reason why you shouldn't try these games. All right, guys, if you're going to hang with me for just a little bit today, let's talk about a game called Let It Die. Now, this game is out there. It's wild. It's crazy. I don't even know how to really appropriately describe it. And I think a lot of people would say it's kind of like this arcade Dark Souls thing. It's got like rogue-like elements to it, sort of, because if you die, then you have to spend, you can spend money to like revive there or or you have to like re revive, reincarnate kind of as a new character. It's it's really weird, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Okay, so like the point is to climb a tower. Like, it, like you just climb a tower and I think there's like some procedure generation to the dungeons but it, it, it's combat is kind of reminiscent of Dark Souls you know it's got Z locking and, and you pick up weapons and you got unique armor pieces and you beat the shit out of other people and then you die and you die a lot and then you know it's, it's a game called let it die so you die over and over and over again um, with this sort of like action RPG sort of feel to it but it's uh, it's very very arcade and it doesn't really have the multiplayer presence of like a Dark Souls game or anything else like that so yeah if you want like a action RPG rogue light type of uh, the experience Try it out. I mean, but it's really fucking weird. But yeah, try it out. Oh man, next game is an MMO that took me completely by surprise. It's called DC Universe Online. It's been out for just a little bit, man. Okay, for a while. But this game actually looks really good and it plays really, really like good. Like, I mean, it plays good, but it's like very action packed. It's, it's very vertical. Like there is so much explosivity with the game. I mean, you can literally have characters that run like the Flash or fly like Superman or just jump from building to building. It, it's pretty fucking ridiculous. Laser beams and all sorts of stuff. Now, it is really cheesy. It's extremely comic book. It's DC Universe Online, literally in the universe of the DC Comics. Yeah, absolutely. But if you get into this game and you give it a chance, it's actually pretty fucking good. It's kind of hardcore in ways. Uh, honestly, for me, I just kind of jumped on and I just jumped around, dude. I just ran around, jumped around, and even though like I was, I came into the game late. I felt like you, the engine is pretty good, man. I think it holds up pretty well. It looks good too, and you know that's gonna go for the PS4 version as well. This is one MMO that you don't want to overlook just because it's comic books. This ain't just for kids, dude. This is a, a well-rounded MMO. You should give it a shot. Next up, we have a game called Planet Side 2. Now, Planet Side 2 is, in my opinion, one of the most unique MMOs out there. It's an MMO FPS. Okay, so there are three factions, and they are all contesting these different territories. And it's just like these giant 
open continents that you go and you just you just fuck shit up man you, it's not just infantry warfare either i mean you got flying vehicles and the flying skill cap is super high dude like seriously they call them uh sky gods when you're in game like if you're really good at, at being a pilot you're gonna destroy everyone um the same thing goes with like the tanks and other, the other different vehicles so like there's a high skill a ceiling for this game absolutely but i will suggest that you play with friends and actually join a group though the game makes it pretty easy to get into the action and get to play with people uh, i just want to say if you just try to lone wolf it around, it's not going to be the same experience. Planet Side 2 is a MMO FPS. You need to join those big groups and actually, you know, do that. That's how the game is played. And if, if you do play that way, uh, even on PS4, you're going to have a fantastic time. Yo, next up on the list is a game called War Thunder. Now, War Thunder is so much bigger than what I imagined it was going to be at first. I thought it was just going to be kind of like, you know, a World of Tanks game, but with warplanes. But they ended up expanding it. Like, they actually put in tanks into the game, and they still have planes. And then they, they're actually putting in warships into the game. So it's like warships and tanks and planes, where the World of series has, like, separate games for each of those. So War Thunder is a massive game, a massive undertaking, even if it was just the flying simulator component to it. And even though I said simulator, guys, and even though I I know it's in a genre that's very niche and hardcore. It's actually pretty intuitive. It's very easy to get into. Deep, but it is actually easy to get into. And so that's why it's fantastic and fits perfectly on the PlayStation 4 as well. Don't be intimidated, guys. Jump into War Thunder. Absolutely, dude, I'm gonna put Smite on this list, guys. Not only do I think it is one of the best MOBAs out there, definitely top three, okay, in my opinion, but Smite plays really freaking good, like, with a controller, even if you're on PC. So on PS4, yeah, it's it's pretty fine. It also looks fine and, you know, all that good stuff. I mean, the art style and everything, it just really fits in and works with a console, okay? So, yeah, man, I feel pretty comfortable sitting back, you know, for those long extended periods, uh, you know, on my couch with the PS4, playing some Smite. It's pretty hype, guys. Yeah, I know, I know, it's a MOBA. For those of you who don't like MOBAs, there are some competitors out there, and there are some other games that fit a similar genre, but not the same genre, but Smite. If you're looking for a true standard MOBA, you know, with itemization, with the full jungle, with, the, you know, the full mechanics, but also action-packed, Smite is the one to play. Now, it's a little bit older, so I, you know, it's a little bit lower on the list, but at the same time, uncontestedly, it's one of the biggest eSport titles out there, and they do have cups, and there are tournaments, even for the PS4 version of Smite, and the consoles, uh, the other console version of Smite, so yeah, check it out, guys. Now, halfway on the list, I'm going to talk about one of those competitors I just mentioned. It's a game called Paragon. This is brand new. I believe it's still beta, but it looks and plays pretty freaking fantastic on the PlayStation 4 still. Now, it's a lot slower than Smite, but it, it's de it's definitely, definitely a true competitor to Smite, though. Um, I think in some ways it's simplified, and in other ways they add some new mechanics. You know, like in Smite, there's no verticality, which is really good for consoles. But in Paragon, since it's a little bit slower paced, they kind of make up for that by adding verticality. Yeah, some characters can, you know, fly up in the air, and they, there's actually, like, different like mountain tops and stuff you can jump off of kind of so it's pretty neat it also looks really gorgeous so if you're looking for a new game to jump into uh then you're gonna want to try paragon absolutely that's gonna be on pc as well I, I know the game isn't fully released yet so pc ps4 whatever dude you guys should really give paragon a shot especially since it just had the new update the monolith update which made the game a little bit faster paced and changed around some things it made it even more vertical it made it more unique so yeah right now is a good time to get into paragon Number four, we have a game called Paladins. Yeah, Paladins is coming out pretty fast here. Uh, they, I didn't think they were going to release a PS4 version so quickly, but it is in closed beta. You can check it out maybe if you can get into it. Uh, but Paladins is a game that is extremely similar to Overwatch, but they add in some MOBA components to the gameplay. There is some customization with the loadouts, but overall its art style is a little bit more simplistic, and the characters are a little bit more straightforward in my opinion, with lower cooldowns, and it's a lot more forgiving in aim. And that, that's actually my experience with the PC version, okay? So bringing it over to the PS4, it's it just kind of fits. It just works. It's not as tight and it's not as like hard to play on consoles as Overwatch is, which is a good thing. It really is, actually. It's a little bit more casual, it's a little bit more silly, but at the same time, it's kind of, you know, really focusing on the strategy and tactical elements. Of course, it's it's still a hero shooter, dude. You still need some aim and all that good stuff. There are still sniper characters. I'm just saying that it's not uh, you know, it's not too fucking insane, okay? Like, I won't be honest. Overwatch Hanzo is garbage. I'm just gonna come out and say that. You can't really play the character to the fullest but in paladins i'm pretty sure you can play every single character to the fullest um almost kind of uh you know uh, it's, it's at least better than most games on consoles all right, yeah, number three is going to be Warframe. Warframe is one of the most popular games in the world, and I know it's like one of the fastest paced games out there, and it has like this huge skill ceiling, 
but it's really completely enjoyable on console as well. I mean, the game's engine looks and runs amazingly on even like just garbage machines. I remember playing this game and recording it on my MacBook Pro way back in the day when the game was first coming out. So this game has only been further optimized. It's only looking better. It's just, it's really just, I don't know, man, a testament to fucking ingenuity. And it just got tons and tons of content. So yeah, Warframe is one of those like really fast paced games that yeah, you can like really dive into mechanically, but it's not quite necessary. It's Space Ninjas, man, are jumping off walls and it's hectic and everything, but it actually works pretty well with a controller. It's pretty fine. And for most frames, and mo for most guns, you're not going to have too bad of a time playing with a controller, I promise. So yeah, Warframe, man. If you just want to jump in as a Space Ninja and just slaughter like hundreds of fucking robots and shits, man, it's pretty cool. It's pretty chill. Check it out. Now, my number two game is going to be debatable, but I'm going to put it for Dreadnought. I think Dreadnought's going to be really cool. I know in a lot of comments, some people are feeling a little bit iffy about it, but I'm really hype about Dreadnought, and I think it's going to work really well with the PS4. Uh, it just it just looks like a PS4 game, especially because it is a slower-paced dogfighting game, where War Thunder is a little bit faster-paced. I mean, it's still a it's no ace combat, you know? It's, it's nothing like that. It's no Gundam game, but Dreadnought is like a slower-paced, more tactical um, dogfighting game with all sorts of different kinds of ships. Some ships are extremely extremely slow um, and they're more strategic and then others are literally like you are a dogfighter. So it depends on how you want to play and either way I think the game's a little bit more forgiving, it's a little bit slower paced so it is still more about that team play, about the tactics, about the strategy and I think that's going to work really well with the console. And overall I mean the game is gorgeous but uh, from my experience on the PC I think it's going to be running very well for PS4 and I believe the game from the very beginning was sort of being optimized and being designed with PS4 in mind so that leaves me excited. I know, I know it's not out yet even on PC but I'm dreaming okay please can I put up, can I put my dream at number two and uh, you know also segueing into number one and my number one is going to be Dungeon Defenders 2. Now, Dungeon Defenders 2 is actually free to play currently. I believe it's still technically early access on PC, but you could play it right now on PC, but it's also coming to PS4. And I'm putting this on PS4 because I had such a history with the original Dungeon Defenders. And I do like Dungeon Defenders 2. But the original Dungeon Defenders was given away on Xbox Live uh, some time ago, man. And that's when I got introduced into the series. And I was, like, blown the fuck away. Like, the it's, it's an action tower defense game. It, it feels pretty comfortable with controllers or PC controls, whatever, of course you know, PC Master Race, but still, man, it's a game that's completely playable, just sitting down, chilling, and maybe that's kind of the point of it, you know, wave survival, just constant grind, um, it, it feels really good to be comfortable playing these kind of games, because you're in it to win it, man, you're in it for a while. Yeah, every character has their own unique little towers, or traps, or auras, or whatever they do, and, you know, mechanically, it's like kind of like a third-person shooter, so they all shoot different and play differently, and there's lots of different kinds of enemies, and waves, and levels, and there seriously is a tremendous amount of complexity. If it looks like a stupid, silly cartoon game, or maybe you... I don't know, maybe you haven't really played a real tower defense game in a while, so you just think it, it, it is just a grind fest. I'm not saying it's not grindy, but there is a lot of depth to this game. Please, as soon as possible, on PC or otherwise, when it jumps on PS4, you gotta try the game. Anyways, guys, that's the end of the list. I know it's a sad day, it's a sad day, but don't worry, there's more. Every day I got videos coming out, and like every other day, or you know, so often, I got top 10, so get hyped for that. Keep it alive, guys. And I just want to say, I'm pretty kind of a little bit confident in this list, okay? I did play every single one of these games, some more extensive than others, but for the most part, yeah, I played these games pretty much a lot. And I'm, I'm pretty excited for them. Uh, and I know some of them aren't out yet, but look forward to them, okay? I think they're all going to play comfortably on the PlayStation 4. I think they're all going to look good. And I do believe they will continue to be popular or become popular very, very soon when they release. So, yeah, guys, thanks so much for watching the Top 10. I have fun making these videos. Hopefully you have fun watching them and also have fun playing the games. My name is Skylant, and I'm going to see you in the next one. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylight, and today we're going to do a top 10 list on free-to-play RTSs. Yeah, all these games are strategy games that have some real-time elements. Now, some of them aren't going to really look like RTSs that you are familiar with. However, they are strategy games that have real-time elements. That's all I'm going to say. That's the umbrella term here, and I know that the RTS genre has kind of waned a little bit, and if you're looking for, especially for free-to-play RTSs, and you're trying to see some other top 10 lists, or, you know, just other websites or whatever, it's all bullshit, okay? And not because I'm a fan of RTSs, Am I doing this list? However, I have played every single one on this list. It's because literally nobody else is doing it right. So I'm here to help you find the games that you're looking for because I myself, I'm interested in getting into RTSs. And so, yeah, I jumped into all these games. Now, whether or not they look like the RTSs you're looking for, I don't know, but I'm sure you'll find at least one game here that'll give you the feeling that you want because honestly, they're just all really weird and different. If you're okay with that and if you can open up your brains, then uh, I think you're gonna have some fun. Let's do it. Top 10 free to play RTSs. 
All right, guys, starting the list, I try to have a controversial item on every list, and here we go. We're going to jump right into it. That's going to be Clash of Clans. Yes, guys, there are real-time elements to this game, but uh, I, I do want to mention that this is asynchronous gameplay. That means whenever you're attacking somebody, you're not attacking them directly. You're just attacking their base, and then they can retaliate and, you know, stuff like that. And people can attack you, but you're not ever actively defending. So just keep that in mind, guys. The Clash of Clans is really one of the only MMO strategy games out there that have real-time elements whatsoever, or really, in my opinion, any gamed elements. Like, it's a video game, but a lot of this genre is just like autoplay and just time-based and just attrition-based. You know, whoever has just more stuff wins. Clash of Clans actually gives you some playability with you placing units in real time, you know, actually using active abilities. And as you destroy their bases in real time, you know, your strategies, your tactics can change around. And also that's going to, you know, determine your defenses, which Clash of Clans has some of the most creative defenses that you could possibly have. A lot of other MMO strategy games, you just kind of build and pre-place plots. But no, Clash of Clans, you actually are creating your defenses, like maybe something like Tower Defense. So really, it kind of feels like a big tower defense game. I'd put it in that genre too. But anyways, it made the list because it's the best and most popular MMO strategy game that has real-time elements. All right, number nine, I'm going to put Clash Royale. And it's only so low on the list because it doesn't look like a normal RTS of what you might imagine an RTS to be, but this is probably the most popular game on the list. It's absolutely freaking huge, okay? Now, Clash Royale is like this sort of new subgenre of RTS. It mixes deck building with like lane, attack, defense, and tower, defense, and attacking. It's, it's just sort of weird and unique and special, but there's a lot of games emulating it now, like Minion Masters, they got Brawl of Ages, and we've also got the new Smite Rivals, which is probably going to be its actual rival. Now, Clash Royale is is very different from other RTSs. You don't really have base building and stuff like that. Uh, however, you can actually make lots of different strategies with the deck building, okay? So you do have card elements and card collecting. Deck building is definitely strategic, okay? However, I'm not going to put a CCG on the list because, you know, turn-based. However, if you're going to make a CCG real-time, I think Clash Royale is a great concept. So yeah, you spawn the cards or the units in real time, you know, in contention with other units that are being spawned by the enemy and you're trying to aggress on the towers and destroy the king or just earn enough crowns to win the match. And the matches are really short. It's really quick. And overall, Clash Royale is super fun. It does have a lot of strategy. It seems simple, but actually, you know, reactionally, this game is really fast paced, really intense, and there is a lot of skill to be had here. I promise. Hey friends, let's talk about a game called Boyd. So Boyd is a light RTS and it is cross-platform too, which is pretty nice. I've played a lot of mobile RTSs, you know, from like tower defense genre all the way through up to like Mushroom Wars, which is like a $10 or more expensive, um, you know, type of RTS or light RTS. So I've played the full range of complexities and I feel that Boyd is really the kind of perfect center there. I think this is really RTS in its most primal form, or most basic form distilled and yet at the same time, not just stupefied, but actually has some original concepts. So let's talk about some of those. Boyd is is just focusing on your units, okay? There's no resource management aside from the numbers of your units and where they are, so it's just the tactics there. And the strategy is focusing on these different capture points, so normally light RTSs don't really have a map, it's just blank and flat. But here, yes, I mean, it's 2D, there are choke points and there are capture points where if you capture them, you can then spawn different kinds of units. So there is like this crazy mind game and tactics and there is true strategy to this game, it's not just attrition, even though you are just focusing on the different units. So for that intensity from such an intuitive game, that's why boy makes the list. Yo guys, all right, so we're gonna talk about a game called Tiger Knight Empire War, and I know, I know it looks like a brawler, it looks like a fighter, you know, maybe For Honor-ish, Mountain Blade-ish, but dude, trust me guys, even though it looks like a Dynasty Wars, Musou type of game, it's actually, that's just kind of like a small added element, because wholly and mostly, this is an RTS, it's a strategy game, and even though it is big team battle, so it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, well, Tiger Knight Empire War really does focus on the strategy elements of outfitting your units, what kind of units, their weapons, their gear, and then the tactical elements of jumping into the game like a real RTS, like a real-time strategy, game and actually creating strategies, you know, flanking positions, or even when you're in the actual conflicts there, the different arrangement of your units that you're utilizing. Working with your team in real time. Maybe send a squad to go flank. Maybe go and take over this siege machine. Maybe go and just fight the general by yourself, you know, at true Dynasty Warrior style. That is an option. And because of the camera angle, it doesn't detract from the RTS elements. It actually adds to it because there are certain flanking strategies and sort of ninja tactics that you can utilize because of that. So the different situations and scenarios that you're going to get in Tiger Knight Empire War and the overall game feeling is going to be wholly unique to any other real-time strategy game that you're going to see on this list or otherwise. And so for that, RTS lovers, you owe it to yourself to try out Target Empire War, despite what first impressions might tell you.
All right, guys, let's talk about 8-Bit Army's Arena. Now, this is going to be part of the series, franchise, saga, IP of the whole 8-Bit, you know, Invaders, Armies, Horde, just all that good stuff. This is the free-to-play version or variant of that. You are relegated to one faction. There's a couple other limitations, but for the most part, yeah, you can play with other players. You get all the, you know, the actual game, the graphics, the cute, chaotic, you know, cubic looking, uh, you know, RTS gameplay. And it is like a full-fledged RTS in that. And even though you don't have the factions, you still can fight against other factions and watch other people play those factions. It's, it's, I mean, it's pretty neat. It's a pretty cool introduction into the franchise, into RTSs overall. Though there is some debate over the skill compression. For instance, like certain things, whenever you're building them, you can't build anything else. And, you know, there, there's certain limitations on some of the workers. And, and there's a lot of limitations with the micromanagement. But that allows new players to really get into the game and focus on the strategy without having to worry about just the intense micromanagement and, you know, the a million billion mi APM that you might need in StarCraft. So, yes, it's StarCrafting. And whenever you think of the general idea of an RTS, this is probably what you're thinking of. And it is free. And at the same time, even really good players sometimes just get way too stressed out playing games like StarCraft. So it's really cool to just kind of chillax, have some fun, and maybe teach a friend or two how to play a proper RTS here with 8-Bit Armies Arena. All right, halfway on the list, dude, we got Istro Lid. Now, this game was actually put on my underrated free-to-play games that I played last year, and it left such an impression on me when it comes to, like, RTSs or jumping into strategy games that I started playing more and more strategy games, and in fact, it's halfway responsible for making this list. So, Istro Lid is a light 2D, you know, RTS, and it is pretty bare bones and simplistic with its art style. No, dude, this game gets complex. It gets crazy, dude. Okay, so Istro Lid's main little gimmick mechanic is that you're building your units piece by piece block by block. You're actually building your army, not just selecting from cards, you're not just deck building. It'd be more like if you're actually creating the cards and then stacking the deck and then building them and playing them in real time and then controlling them in real time against everybody else that's doing the same thing and then rockets and then missiles and then whoa, it gets crazy, dude. For a light RTS, this is probably the most intense uh, when it comes to actual strategy elements. And in a real time strategy game, of course, I'm going to wait the strategy elements on this list. So halfway, I've got Eistra Lid. Please check it out. Coming in at number four, we have Air Mech, which is probably the closest thing to a proper MOBA that I was going to put on this list. See, Air Mech is kind of like a MOBA because you do control a character, and I think the game really comes to life in 2v2s. It is an arena RTS, and you do actually level up, gain abilities and stat points throughout the match with your, you know, your transforming UFO airship freaking robot thing uh, in disguise, whatever, <laughs> more than meets the eye. But really, that's just sort of a vessel for you to control your armies. You do spawn your different creeps. You actually choose which creeps that you have, you know, you kind of like a Assemble your deck of the different units and then you spawn them in real time and not only do you just spawn them but you actually manually place them and tell them what to do and then of course you yourself are running and gunning freaking arena shooter speed style wrecking other people's armies and units and also head to head themselves this game's also cross platform too like freaking i remember playing it on the chrome web store browser base you can also download it on steam and it's also on and it's also on consoles it controls pretty good with a controller and if you want an rts that is all about the micro intensivity of a single unit then that's air mech of course you got a little bit of macro as well that is the overarching strategy but dude this game is fast keep that in mind and have fun Number three is going to be the most surprising to me, and that's Art of War Red Tides. During my first impression, I immediately saw just the kind of bullet points. You know, I, I saw what the game was. It's like, oh, it's a single lane. Okay, we only control the creeps, right? It's three players on each side for one lane. What? It's just going to be a mosh pit of just creep spawning. And that's kind of what it is. But actually, dude, it gets really, really in-depth. Sure, there's no mechanics. Like, you're going to have an air mech or tiger knight or a lot of arena RTSs. There's not even an arena. It's literally just one lane, and it's played in phases, if that makes Makes sense to you but no seriously all the different units that you can actually accrue and use and then the resource management system is similar to a lot of arena rts's you can just focus on managing your resources gaining resources um, and you can do some small waves and then you can have a monster wave and if you ever played mobas then you know that controlling the creep push and pull is really important and vital and now just kind of just focus on that just focus on the creep the creep mechanics and there's an entire game to be played around that and that's what this game is obviously inspired from games similar to clash royale and those kind of mods from the warcraft days and here it is, a full-fledged free-to-play RTS that is just strategy. Like, that's it. It's just the strategy. Yeah, it's still team-based. And it's, yeah, it's still very intuitive and easy to get into. At first glance, it seems simple, but please give it a shot. Art of War will surprise you. 
Number two on the list is a browser-based little game called Little War Game. That's it, Little War Game. Please type that in. Actually, if you just type in free RTS, it should be like the first or second thing on Google. It's an amazing game that is really actually not that little. Sure, in a lot of ways, it, it, I mean, it's pixel art, right? It's played on the browser. In a lot of ways, it is light. It is simplified. But it's a full-fledged RTS, and it's the only one that I saw that really properly emulated an arena RTS fully to the full extent. <laughs> I could just say that even more. Little War Game even has, like, tournaments and they have streams and there's like this little niche community. It is beautiful and it's wonderful. And this was actually the first RTS I ever really gave a shot. And I had so much fun. There is a, there's a full, can I just say full more? There is a full map maker that you can utilize for free. Now there's only one faction, but you get full use of the arsenal and you can play anybody at any time. You get the server browser. I mean, I think it's missing some features, probably like land and some other things that you get in bot purchased games. Sure, I understand that. But Little War Game is whenever you're looking for a list like this, or whenever you're looking for a free to play RTS or, you know, whenever people People just have the concept of wanting a game similar in this genre of what this list embodies, then they're gonna want a game like Little War Game. That's what Little War Game is. It's a game that's easy, it's intuitive to jump into, but at the same time, no, it's still a full on complex uh, RTS. So, yeah, it's not a light RTS, it doesn't have any random gimmicks. You have seen these mechanics in other games, but for free, in a browser game that anybody can play at any time, that plays well, that has a full fledged feature set, again, it's a full game for free. Body, heart, and soul, this is a great free-to-play RTS. Probably the spearhead of the genre. Now the number one might surprise you or maybe not. The number one's gonna be StarCraft 2. Okay guys, seriously, uh, arms down please. StarCraft 2 actually are somewhat recently, kind of a little bit, uh, revamped its free to play or trial demo account premium thing, whatever. StarCraft 2 now as a free player, you can just download it and you are able to use all three factions and you can go and play the matchmaking. So compared to all the games on this list, you can play a much more in depth, much more complicated, much more real, and very serious RTS for free, okay? However, you don't get to play ranked, so keep that in mind. And you don't have access to the campaigns. You actually do get to demo some of the campaigns, which is more than a lot of these games have. So either way, guys, if you consider it a demo or not, it just kind of doesn't actually matter because in terms of raw stuff that you just kind of get and consume, it's a lot for free. It is actually a full game for free in disguise. You get the multiplayer. And if you actually get to play with a person that owns some of the expansions or the full game, you get that as well as long as you're playing with them. An amazing product that they are, that, I don't know, man. If you call this a demo, this is the most extended demo I've ever seen. StarCraft 2, I'm putting it, it's so much content that I am putting it as number one on my free to play RTS list because you seriously just get that good of an experience, that well-rounded of a product for, well, the price of free. And then you have the option of upgrading to getting even more. So yeah, love it or hate it, or you know, if you agree with me or not, please let me know in the comments below, but I'm sticking it at number one. Oh yeah, one small little thing. Um, yeah, the original StarCraft is being given away for free now. So yeah, there's a thing. Thanks so much for watching my top 10 list, friends and family. Yeah, top 10 RTSs that are free to play. Hopefully you appreciate all the little uniquities I sprinkled out throughout the list, but honestly, there's really not that many free to play RTSs, games that you could really call RTSs or games that you could really call free to play. Uh, but this is probably the best that you're going to get. You know, I scoured the internet, looked for lots of lists, looks for lots of recommendations, and uh, these games, a lot of them didn't even make those lists. So this is probably your go-to source for free to play RTSs. It's a little bit tragic. I really want the RTSs RTS genre as a whole to grow, but also these little unique little genres that have been popping up all over the place, especially on mobile devices and browser based. Really want to see those succeed and hopefully they will. Hopefully we can make it come back, guys. So keep the hype alive. Hope you guys had fun with the video and have fun with the games. My name's Skylint and I'll see you in the next one. What's going on friends and family? My name is Skylint and today I'm going to show 10 games that are niche, that are free, that are new, that I think you guys should try out. I know they're not for everybody. However, this collection of games Maybe you'll find something that you'll stick with. Maybe you'll just have an experience. Actually, I implore that you play any, all of these games because they will leave an impression on you. They will leave you with something, okay? Uh, good or bad, I don't know, but I think that they're all worth at least trying because they're freaking weird, okay? And me, I'm a fan of uniquities. Literally, my slogan here is that we go into the nooks and niches of the gaming market and communities. We try out new stuff and share it, and that's what it's all about. So this is a top 10 that really exemplifies the stuff I'm into, and hopefully you guys can explore that with me. So let's do it. Top 10 new niche free-to-play games.
All right, guys, first up, we got Gloria Victus here at number 10. Now, the game is actually pretty in a rough state, I would say. I uh, will, compared to many in the genre, it's actually pretty freaking awesome, but it's not quite free to play yet. You still have to buy into it. It's still early access, and I mean, it's it's early access, like literally, okay? So, a lot of the functionality of the game is not polished, and there's actually just like a lack of functionality in many aspects. However, the core concept there being this sort of low fantasy uh, faction versus faction, open world PvP sandboxy type of thing, it's actually pretty cool. A couple other games have been trying to do it, a couple other MMOs do it exist. However, I feel like Gloria Victus is actually our best bet, even in early access. Even though I have, you know, played through it and I've seen its roughness, I really actually still believe in the production of this game. I feel like it's actually going to go places. So, that's why I'm saying it here. Yes, it's not for everybody, and even to the people that do like the genre, there are competitors that maybe are technically fully released, but no, actually, I think I'm keeping the hype alive for Gloria Victus. Now coming in at number 9, we have Battle Right. This is a MOBA that just completely focuses on the battle arena portion. Some people would call this genre the brawler genre, or brawler MOBA, or multiplayer online brawlers. Anyways, so it's just 3v3 or 2v2 or 1v1, and it completely focuses on the mechanics of character versus character. Now, there are rounds, and in between the rounds, you actually do get traits that kind of enhance your gameplay, but overall, it doesn't have itemization. It doesn't have the normal MOBA map, and it's really, I, I can't stress this enough, incredibly mechanically intensive. So fighting games on PC already pretty freaking niche. But then put that into like the MOBA genre, which is already competing with like League of Legends and stuff like that. So to people who actually enjoy this game and really dive into it, yes, there's definitely some uniquities. But to a new player, it's going to seem like it's kind of falling in between two worlds where there's just a whole lot of competition already. But I'm going to ask you guys, dive into it, check it out. There's a whole lot of goodness here in Battle Right. Coming in at number eight, we have Tiger Knight Empire War. Now this is gonna be for the player that's a little bit more of like a history buff or maybe somebody who really likes to fantasize and theorize about mixing and matching different armors and different unit types and seeing how that actually uh, stacks up in a historical sense, but not really, it's definitely still a game. I don't know, people who like World of Tanks and World of Warships will actually probably fall in love with this game as well, even though mechanically, seemingly, and aesthetically it's very different. I think actually in the end, the, the overarching like gameplay is very similar to those games. It's, you know, big team battle, slower pace, more strategic the customization and monetization is actually like identical to world of tanks and overall like the mixing and matching of units and the literal rts mechanics because you can actually send out your different units in different places is very much in line with something i would expect from that genre of you know the world of series so if you're really a fan of those kind of things but you kind of want a little bit of a mountain blade-ish kind of mechanics to the game because you do actually control your commander and of course in a medieval setting i think that this is the fantasy that you want to go and play Coming in at number 7, we have Faria, which even in the tactical CCC genre, which I've, I've already done a top 10 just on that genre, a uh, Faria is really special because tactical CCGs focus on board play. However, Faria is the only one that I've played where you actually build the board as you play it. So it's definitely just a little bit more special. Also, I really appreciate because you build the board and it's board and land mechanics, which is something like basically if Magic the Gathering had a literal board you play on, then that's kind of what Faria would be like. That actually changes around a whole lot of the deck building and mechanics. And overall, since CCGs are about deck building, I feel like Faria has some of the most unique decks that you could possibly make. A lot of different gimmicks, a lot of different strategies and tactics. And I really appreciate Faria for that. So yeah, the whole board, you know, building gimmick, it's more than just the gimmick. However, at the same time, it separates it greatly from other tactical CCGs, makes it maybe a little bit more niche, but to me, a little bit more special. Next up on the list, coming in at number six, we've got Scara the Blade Remains. Now I played this back in like press access, pre super pre alpha, and it was extremely rough, completely unplayable. However, it's come a long way from where it has been. I think it's still pretty rough around the edges, but it's trying to do something unique and interesting. Now I have played actually a couple of other games that are in a similar or branching genre, such as Archblade. There was this game called Chronix, and actually I could just list and list and list tons of games that you have no idea what I'm talking about because this genre of like these. 3D team brawlers, or I don't even know what you would call it. I mean, it almost seems like a MOBA, like Battle Right, but the camera angle change does impact the gameplay a lot. And I don't know, this this whole like MMO battleground-ish similar genre is just something that's uh, very unheard of. This is incredibly niche, and Scar itself is still not very popular, even though it's probably the most popular of the genre, especially because it's just now releasing. So I don't really know what to say about this. Think like Soul Calibur if there's teams, maybe? It's kind of like that, and I really want to play these games. However, it just kind of happens that not many people play these games. For one reason or another, I don't know, but Skara is probably the best one to bet on.
Halfway on the list, we have a game that I actually put in my top 10 2D arena shooters, and that's gonna be Awesome Knots. So Awesome Knots being a 2D side-scrolling platforming arena shootery MOBA is definitely very niche, but uh, also the fact that it wasn't free-to-play. It just now went free-to-play. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a big reason why it wasn't very popular. I mean, it, it was known. I mean, it is a known awesome game. Awesome Knots is pretty awesome, but the thing is, is that it cost kind of a, a good chunk of change for comparatively what it was and, you know, the MOBA genre as a whole. So even when I had press access to go actually and play during the giant expansion, new characters and stuff like that. I actually had trouble finding matches, so hopefully it's not too late to go free to play like a couple other games that happened recently. Hopefully now people can jump on and see the charm and see the character and the love in this really weird game, but it, hey, it's a really good weird game. All right, guys, next up on the list, we have the Secret World Legends, which is something of a read launch for Secret World. It's going free to play as well, and it's supposed to have an update to a lot of the mechanics. Mainly, I think the combat is getting a revamp. So Secret World was a game that I was like extremely excited to get into. However, I didn't because the gameplay just didn't really jazz with me since I was a big fan of like, you know, the free roam and explosivity of World of Warcraft back in the day. Uh, however, I think with the Secret World Legends and now my more mature taste in action RPGs, I think I might appreciate it a little bit more. Now, it's really niche because it focuses really more like, I know it's an action RPG, but it really focuses on the RPG. I actually put this in my top 10 RPG MMO list as number one because it's really more of like a role play and diving into these communities as a player and an avatar and a person all combined and really exploring these stories. It's a very storied game and it's very interesting and intricate like that. However, the combat update, maybe more people will play it, more people will try it, and maybe I and you, and maybe we can all fall in love with it. All right, coming in at number three, we have Fractured Space. Now, this slot was actually competed for by a game called Cloud Pirates, as well as a game called Dreadnought. However, I feel like Fractured Space is the one that I really want to put on this list because it's the one that really pushes forward that the nichities, <laughs> the uniquities, really pushes forward that World of Tanks in space kind of gameplay where it's really strategic, really slow paced, and it has just a tremendous amount of customization, requires a tremendous amount of team play, and just other games that are coming out don't quite emphasize that enough. So you have Dreadnought, which is a little bit more uh, kind of dogfighty. Cloud Pirates as well, even though it's airships and has a really unique aesthetic, is actually very similar to Dreadnought. And then you get into genres like War Thunder, which is straight up dogfighting. So this really slow three-dimensional flying or aerial combat, you don't quite get it to the extent like you do in Fractured Space, and that's simply why it made the list. Coming in at number two, we have Quake Champions. This is a game that I've covered extensively and I enjoy and I'm gonna continue streaming and I like it and I think it's really cool. And really, like the numbering on this list is kind of arbitrary because I'm ranking it based on quality, but at the same time as uniquity and normally those things don't quite go hand in hand. Uh, but however, Quake Champions is a cool game. However, it is more or less like half the same of what Quake has always been and it's it's very arena shootery. A lot of people are gonna be like, yo, that's Quake. I mean, it's got champions, but it's still Quake. So overall, in terms of uniquity, you know, I mean, for the arena shooter genre, it's, it is actually very special. Adding in these characters and how they work mechanically with the game is pretty special. It does change the game, but it's still an arena shooter. It's still Quake, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, it's a pretty awesome game. I very much enjoy it. I like what they're trying to do and they're striving for new things with a genre that's really freaking set in stone. They're trying to carve out a new path. I appreciate that, but I know some people also won't. They don't really like the changes. And some people think that changes more, ch and some people think that more changes should have actually occurred. Maybe Maybe kind of like myself, I think that maybe we could have some different weapons that aren't a decade old, but hey, that's why it's only number two. Number one, we have Snow. Now, you can actually go click the link in the description to see my first impressions on all these games, the videos, uh, relevant top tens, uh, but Snow is a game that I really just, I dig so much, man. I know that there is Steep, that is a competing game that's not free to play. However, I feel like Snow has some very special things that I could just go on and on about, which I literally do in my first impressions and multiple videos I've done on the game. Uh, but this is a game that is just, it's so chillaxed, okay? It's a snow sport, free to play, open world, kind of sandboxy get little game. I, it's weird, okay? Like, it's an extreme sport game, but at the same time, it doesn't really feel that extreme. It's not just in your face, whoa, boom, pow. It's it's more kind of slow paced, and there's a lot of little tiny intricacies to the mechanics of the game that can make the game really awkward, but at the same time, there is a lot of playability if you can get past that initial hurdle. So I will warn you guys about that, and actually many of these games on this list, there is gonna be an initial hurdle of, whoa, this is really weird, I don't know if this is for me. Just try it, I promise. It will leave an impression on you. 
Thanks for making it to the end, guys. I had a lot of fun putting together the list. I had a lot of fun playing the games, and hopefully you do too. I just want to say I really appreciate you guys, and I'm glad that you appreciate me appreciating these games, and hopefully we can appreciate it together cyclically. Uh, that'd be really fantastic. Give a like, subscribe, share this on Reddit, and stuff like that. You know, the video. Get, get the gospel out there. Okay, guys? It'd be really fun. Uh, this channel's new. These games are newish, and the whole point is, is to meet new people and have new experiences, so I kind of need you guys to make this work, and hopefully we can continue having fun. My name's Skylint. I'll see you in the next one. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylight, and today we're going to be talking about the top 10 best co-op IO games. These are games that you could play with friends, absolutely like with friends, literally, and working together with them, uh, not in contest. Though some of these games are a little bit more free-for-all, and some of these actually are made so that you jump into the game and then make friends from there. You, you guys will see what I'm talking about immediately. But these games are not so much the complete free-for-alls that we expect with games like Agario. These are a little bit more structured and they're a little bit more unique or team based or straight up just co-op, okay? So keeping that in mind, hopefully we'll find some games for you to have fun in. So let's do it. Top 10 co-op IO games. All right, starting our list, we have Bellum.io, and I think the best way to explain this game is kind of like think of Go or something maybe like Splix.io, but then make it like militaristic and give yourself a resource that you actually have to accrue. Uh, so yeah, there is a little bit of economy management in the game, and it kind of almost plays turn-based. It's not quite turn-based, but anyways, this is a weird niche military Go-like game um, where you start out, and it's it's definitely free-for-all in the beginning. However, the reason why it's on the list, it's so low though because you do start out free-for-all, but it's on the list because you actually have alliances. Yeah, there's 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 this weird sort of alliance system where you could be like, hey, friend, I'm going to promise not to kill you. If you promise not to kill me, and take over my territories. Let's focus on killing this guy that's in between us. And then from there, we'll go our separate ways or we can continue to take over the world. Kind of. These matches last for like 20 something minutes, really elongated, big matches. And there is a lot of strategy with this game, with your economy management, with where you're actually placing your units and even what kind of units or tile that you want. If you constantly click on a tile, you can actually bolster its defenses. So basically, the idea is you just kind of want to take over over the world and you know control as much land as possible and be as big as possible but at the same time try not to spread yourself too thin because people would be able to just run over your territories and then kill you real fast like so there is definitely a team element to it more so than the agario type games and that's why it starts off our list Next up on our list, we have a game called Starve.io, and the best way I could just easily explain this game is, you know, something, you know, like a survival game, kind of like, I don't know, Rust, you know, Ark Survival Evolved, minus the dinosaurs, though. Um, no, this is what this game is. Okay, so it's an IO, top-down, 2D, just survival server game, and it's done pretty good. <laughs> uh, it's actually very difficult. Essentially, if you guys thought Don't Starve was difficult, this game is seriously just so difficult, they don't even put don't in front of it. It's just starve. You will starve. You you will freeze to death, uh, you will die probably to other players and etc. So it is a free to play free for all game, but it is really highly incentivized because of the difficulty of the game to group up. So grouping up, making alliances, making friends, that's what this is all about. Now it's still way more free for all than a lot of other games on the list. That's why it's lower, but absolutely. If you jump in this game with some friends, you can have a great time. Next up, we have a game called Hordes.io. Now, this is one team, one faction versus another faction, and it's really reminiscent of something like the Battlegrounds of MMOs or World of Warcraft specifically. You have a few different classes that you can play as, so you can kind of specialize and help out, you know, your actual group, your little squad out a little bit better, you know, maybe heal up a little bit, maybe be the tank, stuff like that. There's also a PvE element, so it is one faction versus one faction, but there's also this sort of, like, jungling aspect to the game. I don't know if you guys play MOBAs, but you actually go and kill these PvE creatures so that you can strengthen up and then you go and do a little bit of PvP and it's just kind of all in the same map, all in the same area and it's just kind of like a cluster flux of awesomeness. But it does really feel very cooperative, very team-based, especially since you do kind of have these sort of RPG-ish roles with the different characters within your squad of friends, within your party. It's definitely one of the most unique IO games I've ever seen, period. So check it out, guys. Coming in next on our list, we have Crew.io. Now, this game is pretty freaking awesome when it comes to co-op. Uh, it's still a PvP game, but you are forced to actually play on a boat with a crew of people. One person is the captain. He's the one who actually pilots the ship. He controls it. He maneuvers it. 
so he gets the little resource packet so you can actually upgrade the ship eventually. But yeah, he just kind of maneuvers around and positions things and everybody else is, is there as a spawner and to actually shoot the cannons because you, you play as cannons. It's pretty weird. Yeah, you guys are all cannons. Like even the captain has like a little captain hat, but he's still totally just like a freaking cannon. So anyways, yeah, you spawn on a boat with a bunch of people and you just try to make it as far as you can. Now playing with a guild, a bunch of friends, this game can feel so awesome. It's something like akin to Agar. It really is. Except instead of just one person is a blob, it's like a whole group of people are helping to survive on this raft, on this blob together. Also, the 3D graphics, pretty nice touch. Next up on the list, we have Moomoo.io. This game is pretty complicated, I think, when it comes to its social economy. See, you start in and you're not affiliated with anybody. It's just free for all. And I guess you can potentially play it solo. Not really, but the game heavily incentivizes you joining a tribe, a clan, a guild, whatever it's called a game. Uh, you want to join these affiliations of peoples that get together and they group up and they party up and uh, you want to make the biggest base that you can. This is a base survival game. It's not really about you surviving. It's really more about keeping your base and maintaining your base. So you need people to, you know, help build defenses, make these bases bigger, more defended, gather more materials, more resources, and obviously more people. The merrier and the better and the easier it is to survive. Of course, you can go solo, but really this game is it's meant to be a game where you jump in and then from there you choose sides you choose teams and that's why it gets mentioned on this list now halfway on our list we have a game called tagpro.gg so tag pro is a game that has been close to me for a very long time i've really enjoyed tag pro a lot since its inception I did videos on it like back when I started my YouTube career. So essentially, guys, you just play as a ball on a team, you know, red balls versus blue balls. <laughs> and you want to just capture the flag. It's a capture the flag game. But as simple as it is, as simple as it seems, this game is actually really competitive. They do have tournaments and I saw some streams and it's still going. It's still a niche community, but this is like one of those real serious games and there's like freaking speed boosts and there's like all these different uh, traps that you can fall into and you can actually make traps like you can actually make it to where you step on a platform and it, it creates like this like wall that will destroy other you know the will pop the balls or balloons or whatever you call them and yeah no dude there's actually a lot of real like strategy and tactics to you know uh capturing the flag and defending and different like uh, capture routes and i don't know dude it, it just it's it's freaking balls capturing flags but it is a lot deeper than that. So yeah, team versus team, if you're looking for that sort of cooperation, check out tagpro.gg. Going into the Big Bad Four, we're starting out with Brains.io. Now, this is a cooperative competitive game. Now, there's been some other games on here where you start out solo and then you join a team. This one's kind of reverse and at the same time the same. So Brains, it's like one person's a zombie, I think one or two, and that's how it starts out, okay? And the idea is that the rest are survivors. And, well, they're trying to be survivors and you're trying to like hold up, you know, get some items. Um, you have like bats and different things to defend yourself with, but really you want to actually kind of maneuver some furniture and block off, you know, exits and, and intros and, and just try to kind of, you know, huddle up together and survive as a team. But then you slowly dwindle down as one zombie infects one person, you know, and infects another person, infects another person. So the teams swap and then, yeah, the, the round ends. You just want to try to be the last one surviving or last until the time runs out. So in this way, there's an interesting concept of cooperation here. Really wanted to highlight that you start out as one team and then the tides turn and you cooperate in a different way. And all in all, this really harkens back to me personally to the infection days. Have you ever played, uh, you know, zombies in Halo 2? Man, absolutely. Brains.io makes me nostalgic for games like that. And I'm so glad that IO games are bringing these weird, fun game modes that I used to play in some other games into a proper uh, scene where we can play them again. Our number three is going to be Zoms.io. Now, I played this a little bit at first, and I was like, okay, I'm going to put it on the list. But then I just happened to stream it one day. A bunch of people joined me, and then I found the true love of this cooperative IO game. When I got a team of four, we could have parties of four, and then you make a base. Dude, you can go places. This game gets intense in the later waves. So, basically, you put your little gold stash down, probably near some resources, right? And the game, aesthetically and mechanically, kind of seems similar to Moomoo.io. But instead of focusing on player versus player initially... It's actually basically wholly a wave survival game. It's kind of a tower defense game. 
you make your base, you try to protect your gold and your gold income and all that good stuff. You protect your guns and protect your friends and have your friends protect you. And you just make as big a base as possible and last as long as possible. Now, there is still PvP in this game. You can actually sneak over with a bow if you want to, buy a bow and snipe their defenses while zombies are attacking them. And, you know, you can actually cause them to die and stuff like that. Um, or you can just go full defense if you want to. You can be aggressive and jump on other people's bases, or you can just tur turtle in a, in a corner somewhere if you want to. There's different upgrade paths from melee, different shields. Uh, you can just focus on your gold income and just try to make them as big a base as possible. And there's a number of different ways to play this, but in every single way, there is some form of cooperation. And for that, I really had to highlight it very highly on this list. Now, number two is Transform Mice. This is a wholly cooperative game, kind of, sort of. I mean, you can actually kind of troll a little bit. You can grief a little bit here, but basically, this is the most adorable, cutest game I've ever seen. Now, me, I was a big fan of Guild Wars 2 jumping puzzles. I love just platforming in games. I used to just do jumping challenges in Halo and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I just love platforming. Platforming is fun. So, a multiplayer cooperative platformer just sounds ridiculous. How does this play out? Freaking awesome, that's how. Basically, you guys are mice. There's actually one shaman mouse, I think, at every level, and they spawn items to either help or maybe hinder gameplay. Uh, and so, basically, it's a physics platformer thing where mice have to work together to either, like, stack items together, you know, stack little objects together so you can jump up top, or maybe you all have to go to one side of a seesaw or teeter-totter or whatever and then run across real quick all together. You know, there's a lot of different levels that have a lot of different sort of physics exploits that as a unit, as a team, you have to exploit together. Or sometimes you can kind of just mess everything up and then just, you know, save yourself or whatever. So sometimes that's going to happen. That's kind of the fun. So it's kind of, it's a cooperative, competitive game. And it's just really weird and different and totally, you know, fa family fun, family fun and friendly. And it's awesome. And that's why it's number two. But yeah, guys, finally, we're at number one, and that's going to be Cursors.io. Now, it's not the flashiest, and it's not as cute as Transfer Mice, and it doesn't have as much, uh, big of a concept as maybe something like Zoms.io or Brains.io. I understand that. But Cursors.io is a game where you absolutely cannot do anything without other players. And sometimes other players can't do anything without you. See, basically, you're, you're just a mouse. You're just a cursor, right? There, there's no characterization to the game. It's, it's simple, right? It's like one of those mouse mazes. But you take your mouse, you take your cursor, and you go through the mazes, and you get to points where there's pressure spots, okay? And you need to actually sit on those for other players to come through, and maybe other players to pass you. And then you gotta wait for a player to sit on the pressure point, and then you can move past. And this creates a really weird cooperative social dynamic that I just haven't really seen in a lot of things ever, basically. And it, it gets, it's almost like this sort of like experimental, like social experiment. <laughs> And kind of similar to Transform Ice, you can kind of mess people up. But the difference here is that in Transform Ice, the levels are instanced. They're single instances. But in Cursors, it's a continuous maze. So if you just bypass somebody, eventually you're actually going to need their help. So it's really in your best interest to just fully cooperate and try to get as many people through the maze. Because through the later levels, things definitely trickle down. All in all, it's a really weird experience. Absolutely. And you know what, guys, on that note, I just want to say that really, I think every single game on this list is a true experience. And being an IO game, you just type it into your URL bar and just boom, there you go. You're having that experience. And not only that, but you're playing with other people together cooperatively, hopefully. And that's why I think these games are really special and different from other proper IO games. You know, the Agars. And I know there are team based stuff like in Deep and Agar. And I know that there are, you know, different game modes to some of these games. But I feel like these ones, they really highlight and they really specialize in just a unique cooperative environment that you normally do not see in IO games. So all in all, yeah, obviously, top 10, I suggest these games. All of them. Just try them because they are IO games, easy jump in, jump out. Whether you like them or not, they'll at least leave an impression on you. So guys, that's what my channel's all about. I like sharing weird games and talking about them and having fun, and I would love to know your thoughts and opinions, and if there's any games I missed, please tell me in the comments below. But if you want to see more, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, keep the hype alive. Remember to have fun, guys. Much love. My name's Skylant, and I'll see you in the next one. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylant. Thanks for joining me for another Top 10. What's today's topic, you guys? know you already clicked on the title. That's right, guys. Top 10 multiplayer mobile games. And I know there's a ton of mobile games out there, and there's also a ton of really bad games. And then when we go into the multiplayer aspect, it's just a bunch of clones upon clones, and which is the real ones, which is the good ones. It is a popular game just because it's popular doesn't make it good. Is a multiplayer that's really good that's not popular? Is it even, should I even play it because nobody's playing it? Like, there's a lot of questions, guys, and there's just a whole lot of games to sift through, but I've done that. All of these games I've played myself, either on their PC versions, their variants, or on mobile devices themselves. 
and I honestly, I just have a lot of fun with these games and I continuously do play these games and I see myself continuing to play them for probably quite a little bit until like a sequel comes out of these or maybe some clone comes out of the woodwork, but I don't think so, man. These games are super original. I just don't see them dying anytime soon. They have good player bases. And ba basically, guys, I just looked at a bunch of different factors, and I think they're good to go, okay? Just trust me, okay? You know me. You guys know me. And if you don't, well, you should subscribe and you know, get to know me. But anyways, let's get into the list. Let's start out with our number 10 here. This game is called Adventure Quest 3D. And I know a lot of you guys maybe are face palming, but I think you probably just didn't give it a shot, okay? So Adventure Quest is a long-standing series of games that tend to be really comical, really car extremely cartoon, and they apparently seem very childish in nature. They're extremely cheesy and corny, and yeah, okay, like, I understand. So get into this game, okay, and then play it. Just just try it, guys, and just talk to people. That That's really what the game is, okay? It's a very, very social, and yes, I'm gonna say childish and maybe child-friendly game, but it, it's very comic bookish, okay? It's very comical, it's very funny, okay? If you actually look to this quest dialogue and you play with these people, there's a lot of social interaction, a lot of social dynamic events that the developers play with their player base. It's, it's a lot of fun when you actually jump in here and consistently play come on every week, every month, you have these new quests, you have these new events that are constantly spawning, and just you're just doing a bunch of new fun stuff. And yeah, I guess at face value, the game isn't physically as enticing as something else like maybe World of Warcraft on PC, but you know, considering it's a mobile game that's also cross-platform, that's mainly focusing on the social aspect, on just having fun and being silly, not taking itself too seriously, this is the best in the genre, absolutely. Next game is Summoner's War. I've only just recently jumped into this, did my first impression on Free MMO Station like yesterday, but I think I can already see the top-notch quality and the reasonings why it is so freaking popular. Now, there are a lot of games out there that are somewhat trying to clone th this game or trying to just kind of get into the space, you know, the whole party capture, like, you know, classic RPG multiplayer thing going on. I don't even know how to describe it, dude. Summoner's War is just kind of special. I guess a lot of people consider a lot of mobile games as its own, you know, genre. It's like, oh, that's a mobile game. But the truth is, is Summoner's War is actually a game, okay? A lot of games have a huge amount of automatic features, and while Summoner's War, you can unlock autoplay features that's really only for grinding, uh, Summoner's War has a huge amount of strategy and tactics built in, okay? Now, I'm not saying it's as in-depth as a classical Final Fantasy RPG or something like that, but when you add into the collecting aspects, you can kind of see, like, the Pokemon kind of mixed with Final Fantasy, but then put into a multiplayer uh, universe, and yeah, there is single-player campaigns and stuff, and you gotta collect it, but a lot of the fun of this game is going to these events, doing these events, these meta events, joining up in guilds and everything, uh, doing these events, collecting time to release monsters and summons and stuff, and then also you can go into the arena and beat other people and show off who has the better team. It's a bunch of it's, it's a bunch of just the collecting and number crunching and stuff like that. So I think people who play Pokemon are really gonna enjoy it. Um, but it also does have some usual RPG turn-based mechanics like in Final Fantasy or something. And plus the overall production value is so much higher than any competitor. So check it out, guys. The screenshots don't do it justice. It plays phenomenally. You guys should really play it. Okay, next game is Pokemon Go. I actually was kind of debating if I wanted to put this on the list, but uh, yeah, Pokemon Go is still a really solid concept. Okay, I don't think it's ever going to be a bad idea. Its execution is not bad either, it's just not super duper amazing. Uh, now, the content that's coming out with Pokemon Go seems to be kind of staggered. Now, I think maybe we're going to be getting the Season 2 here pretty soon, so we're going to get, you know, Generation 2 Pokemon, uh, maybe Generation 3 at a more expedited rate, but... From launch until now, there really hasn't been too much new content, so really been staggered, and it's been kind of tragic, I think, the rise and fall of Pokemon Go, but the truth is that it's still massively popular, you can still have a good amount of fun with Pokemon Go, it's kind of a good excuse just to get out in the world, maybe talk to a few people, it's not the phenomenon that it was before, but it can always resurge with new updates, it always has that potential, it will always have that potential. Now, there are some other games coming on the horizon that's like a, you know, like a Magic or Harry Potter issue Go kind of game. And there's a couple other Go games, you know, coming out there. But I think Pokemon Go is still the one true Go game that has the most potential, even though it's kind of somewhat flopped. But then again, this is a flop that still has millions and millions of players, right? So, absolutely, it's never too late to get into Pokemon Go. Though, I mean, you know, the best time to plant a tree is yesterday. So, get out there and try to catch some Pokemon now while you can, because you never know. It could, it could fail. It could just continue to drop from here. Okay, here's a game that I... Man, you, you guys in the comments, 
I I've done a couple of top tens, especially in the IO games list and the browser game list. You guys have constantly said Splix.io. Now, I had played Splix, and it's a pretty cool browser game. I just think there's some other games that maybe were better and more suited toward the PC audience that I, you know, I put put those games on those top tens lists. But honestly, Splix.io is freaking fantastic on mobile devices. So yeah, you can get it on mobile devices. Now, honestly, in this spot, I could pr I've probably put any IO game. But I think Splix is the one that really deserves my attention personally, okay? Because it is a really awesome game. It has a lot of skill factor into it. Um, I had fun even just watching some streams of it, watching some montages. Like, there is some skill. There is some strategy and tactic to the game, absolutely. Um, it's just, and it just works with the control scheme of mobile devices. I think it's just perfect. It's fast, it's furious, it's intuitive as hell. You just jump in, you splix, man. You just splix.io, and it just, it works, okay? And plus, I probably maybe could have put it on some other top tens. Finally, it's deserving a spot on this one. Okay, next game, we have Albion Online. Now, I'm getting a little bit tired of putting this on top tens, because I think it's showing my bias too much, okay? I am just really hype about this game. Now, maybe it's undeserving because the game has its its launch date extended once again, guys. So it's going to take like a, a whole year before this game is actually fully released. It's pretty ridiculous. I mean, it went from being free to play to buy to play and then like it just keep extending the date and they just keep changing the game over and over again. I think when it does launch, it's going to be a fantastic game, but it's just like, man, dude, I'm getting worn out. I can't keep putting it on top 10 lists, but even in its current state, dude, it's still not a bad game. It can, it could maybe potentially not be a great game when it launches, but it will never ever be a bad game. So there's at least that. For an MMO of this caliber, even on PC, it's freaking cool, man. It's like Ultima Online-ish kind of full loop PvP. I mean, sure, it doesn't have the, the, you know, characteristic quests of RuneScape, but for a PvP game, especially one that's also worked so well on mobile, there just isn't anything like it. So hell yeah, slapping Albion Online on the list. And now we have Clash of Clans. Yep, this game was going to be on the list, you guys. Knew it was going to be on the list. Now, there's actually some games that I really like that's in the same genre, which is going to be like Dominations. Now, some people really like Game of War or uh, similar games that really kind of copy the aesthetic of Clash of Clans, but not the actual gameplay. You see, the difference between other MMO strategy games and Clash of Clans or Boom Beach or Dominations is that there's actual mechanics, okay? It's not just pay to win, it's not just attrition. You have to actually place your units depending, you know, you have to choose which kind of units, where to place them, when to place them. You also create defenses. So it's like tower defense, tower offense, but set in sort of like an MMO-ish kind of space. And this is really special. This makes Clash of Clans truly, in my opinion, the best of the best in its genre because everything else just really fails in the, from the mechanical standpoint, okay? Like Game of War, there just is no mechanics, okay? It's just attrition. Whoever has the bigger, better army, and that's pretty much it. There's no true creativity, there's no true character, and Clash of Clans has that. So every single time until a game really trumps it, I will put Clash of Clans. And next up for MOBA category, I have Vainglory. Absolutely. Now, there are actually a few MOBA games that are pretty not bad. Okay, they're pretty not bad. Some of them are bad. But there's a lot that are actually pretty decent on mobile devices, but Vainglory is legitimately able to compete with PC games. They actually have tournaments, they have pretty big streams, um, and just the mechanics overall really kind of reminds me of something mixed between League of Legends and Dawngate, if you remember that game. It's got a huge amount of character. It's got a huge amount of color, and it's it's truly mechanical, okay? Like, you are going to be tappity-tapping all over the screen, and these characters have a lot of skill shots, there's a lot of agility, there's just a whole lot of ferocity coming out of this mobile, this light MOBA game. And absolutely, I've done a couple of top tens talking about MOBA games, I've slapped Vainglory on there. And, and of course, in mobile games, Vainglory is, the, in my opinion, the best mobile MOBA. And if you were to compete it with some other MOBA on the market, I would probably put it in my top five personal favorites. Absolutely, freaking lutely Vainglory is sweet, guys. It is good. And next game, we have Clash Royale. Clash Royale is a lane offense and defense game. It plays in real time, which is spectacular, okay? There's not many on this list even that do real time actual gameplay, you know, PvP and competitive even. So Clash Royale is a deck building game uh, where you build decks, you actually select different cards, and then you summon those units um, in real time as they go down up lanes or you summon towers to defend different lanes and different areas. And it's just a tremendous amount of fun, okay? Now, I know some people have some complaints about how the matchmaking is really unfair because you can go against people who have just overall stronger cards because they've played longer or have spent money on the game. But in the end, it is still a game that is unmatched on the mobile platform and even on PC. Now, there are some games coming out like Legion uh, TD, 
that's coming out, but Clash Royale, still, for now, is just the number one, and probably for all time. It's just gonna be the biggest and best, because, dude, from the makers of Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, the marketing, it's just too big, it's got too big of a scene, it's not stopping. In fact, Clash Royale is the game where I had the most of uh, viewers any at one time. I had like 320 viewers on Twitch, which is pretty big for me, you know, I'm a new guy um, when I was streaming, so Clash Royale is still pretty hype, and will be for a while. And the next game is extremely new, I actually just played it today, but holy crap, it just burst its way on this list. A game is called Plants vs. Zombies Heroes. Now, it's kind of reminiscent of a game like Scrolls. Do you guys remember Scrolls? It never really truly released, it's probably Mojang. Um, there's also a couple of uh, games on mobile devices that are, it's like, it's tactical card games, but they work in lanes, not exactly playing boards. So this is that kind of style. It kind of is reminiscent of Clash Royale because it has the lane thing and it definitely has cards. Um, but it's more similar to something like, it's like Hearthstone mixed with Clash Royale. So you do have lanes, but it's it's more like scrolls kind of, and it's not like monsters really move up and down the lanes. So it's really its own unique blend. Plus you have to consider that it's completely asymmetrical. So you can choose different heroes, but then you have different factions. You have the plants and then you have the zombies. And this is a PVP game, guys, by the way, which it does have a campaign, which is freaking awesome. Little little cool things that you can do to learn the game. You know, a little campaign. That's always great. I love I love campaigns in games like this, especially mobile games. But Plants vs. Zombies Heroes is PVP. So one player chooses zombie, the other player chooses plants. And then from there, you can choose the different heroes in that faction and it plays completely asymmetrical. Like, zombies get two turns during a turn phase, or two, they have two extra, they have two phases during a turn, and then the plants have only one turn because they go second, because going second is an advantage, because the turns actually happen simultaneously. Uh, it's kind of complicated, guys, but then you place different plants in different rows, which is really reminiscent of the original game, you know, tower defense, and then you shoot down the lanes and you do the damages, and it's just got a bunch of really crazy mechanics that in the end really reminds me of just Plants vs. Zombies uh, mixed with Hearthstone, basically. And boom, there you go, Plants vs. Zombies Heroes. It really is a truly unique game that I think you guys should give it a shot right now. E even though I didn't really explain it that well because there's, honestly, the tutorial took like 20 minutes. It's actually a lot more in-depth than the light art style would really, you know, lean towards. And number one, guys. It you, it's gotta be Hearthstone, okay? It's gotta be. As much as I am a fan of games like Vainglory and Albion Online really pushing the boundaries of what a mobile game could do, the truth is, is that when people play mobile games, they're looking for a particular type of enjoyment. Uh, you know, they spend a certain amount of time on it, they want to do certain things, uh, it can't be too distracting, but at the same time it should be engaging, blah blah blah. There's just so many reasons why somebody would want to play a mobile game, especially a multiplayer online game. Uh, and Hearthstone just checks off all those and does it spectacularly. Okay, you guys know what Hearthstone is. It's one of the biggest, best card games out there on PC or otherwise, but as a mobile game, it is truly fantastic. It can be run on pretty much any device. It looks and plays great on tablets. It's fantastic, iOS, Android. It's just, it's gonna work, okay? It's gonna, you pick up your device, it's gonna work, and it's gonna play well, and you're gonna be able to be competitive. You know, if you're fine with the grind. Yeah, it is an extremely grindy game, but then at the same time, it's got a huge amount of cards. There's a lot of customization. And in card games and in mobile games where you're constantly picking up and dropping it, Hearthstone matches are just long enough, and at the same time, the deck building is just deep enough that it's really filling every niche that you... Because it, it's customization, right? It's customizable. You can do what you want to do and play the way you want to play, even with the single-player content, which is truly challenging, and at the same time, you can go at your own pace. So, all in all, it checks everything off, Hearthstone just kind of has to be number one. You know what I'm saying, guys? So that's it. That's the list, guys. Adventure Quest 3D, Summoner's War, Pokemon Go, Splix.io, Albion Online, Clash of Clans, Vainglory, Clash Royale, Plants vs. Zombies Heroes, and Hearthstone are going to be my top 10 best multiplayer mobile games uh, for right now. Okay, there are some games that are coming out on the horizon that we will see. I'm thinking, you know, Final Fantasy XI being released for mobile is going to be pretty hype. But for now, these are the games that are, in my opinion, the best. They're also, they tend to be the most popular games in their respective genres. And overall, I think that, I think anybody could probably find at least one game on this list that's going to be a new true love. Okay, for at least mobile multiplayer gaming. I know it's kind of a weird niche, but the truth is, is that more and more games are coming out. Uh, people have better cellular, you know, service, or they play on Wi-Fi. And mobile games are becoming bigger, they're becoming better, and more accessible, and so more people are going to be playing these, and playing them more seriously. Like I said, Vainglory and Hearthstone, they have, they have official tournaments, man. Money being dished out. So, pretty hype there, guys. And in the end, I just want you guys to have fun, okay? It's my, still my personal opinion, but I do want you guys to have fun. So, keep that in mind, guys. Hey, my name's Sky Shore. If you want to like and subscribe for more top tens and, you know, try to learn and discover new games, that's what we're all about here. Join the family, friends. All right, guys. Truly, hope you have fun, and I'll see you 
in the next one. Hello friends, my name is Skylight and today I want to talk about my pick, my top 10 list for IO games. Got IO? So IO games are browser-based games, generally kind of end with a, you know, dot IO, and many of them are copying sort of like the aesthetic or the design and sometimes just outright actually literally copying every single thing about Agar dot IO. I just want to say that these games are going to be somewhat reminiscent of Agar dot IO. They have dot IO at the end of it and they're just browser-based games. If you want to see full inclusion of all sorts of different kinds of browser-based games. I have a whole list just for you guys there. You can click on the screen right now if you want to see that, but this is going to be .io games. These are open lobbies. They feel like very small, room-sized MMOs in a way, if that makes sense. They're very light, very casual, easy to jump into, and they're basically Battle Royale-style games in one way or another, you know, in the shape of a guard.io. So, with that in mind, top 10 IO games. All right, so starting out the list, I will mention Agar.io. Agar, you can play on your mobile devices. A lot of these you can also play on mobile devices, but all these browser-based, just type, literally guys, it's not just the name, it's like the web address. You type in Agar.io, it's gonna be the case for all these games. Anyways, Agar, or Agario, some people would call it whatever. It's, you know what it is. You've seen it, you probably have played it. Some people have played it a lot. It is a fun game. So I think it's kind of gone a little bit downhill, maybe-ish, since they added in microtransactions. It's just, it's what happens when you get super duper popular sometimes, but that will hopefully allow funding for new games, or you can just, you know, check out these other developers taking the concept and branching it out, going in a little bit different directions, and uh, maybe overall just being a better, uh, more polished game as we see further down in the list. Some more interesting concepts are being explored, but Agar to IO was the father of them all. I mentioned that in my other top 10 list, and I will mention it here. Agar is still a solid game. Yes, there's other, you know, clones, exact clones of this game, um, but I think the originator is probably the most polished, and and from here on out, you should go into a more original direction, which is going to be every other one on this list. Now I think let's go ahead and talk about the next popular IO game. It's going to be Slither.io. Slither is basically competitive Snake. I mean, it's like Snake the MMO. PvP Snake. Uh, it's basically Agar, okay, where you are an object trying to eat smaller objects. But the unique thing about Slither versus Agar, where in Agar you eat just smaller circles, in Slither you are a snake and you're trying not to hit the sides of other snakes. You can also speed up and kind of trap other people so that they are forced to be devoured. It's very interesting because once they actually are destroyed, you don't instantly devour something. Like once something runs into the side of another object, they are obliterated, but then there's like their energy or their particulates kind of remain. And everybody is just like can free for all and just eat the carcass of whoever just died. It's a very interesting sort of gameplay aesthetic. And Agar is very straightforward and Slither, it's like actually the opposite of that. It is the opposite of straightforward, literally you are trying to be coy and just kind of like curve around everything and be sneaky kind of like a snake you almost but yeah i think it's really appropriate just to say it's uh it's basically competitive snake the mmo and it's kind of how it plays it looks all cute and everything but this game's hardcore guys Next up on the list, we have a game called Limax IO. It's incredibly polished looking. It looks extremely clean. I've only had a couple of stuttering issues with the game, but it is newer. And I just want to say that it's essentially Agario mixed with Slitherio. <laughs> Slither.io and Agar.io. Uh, basically, you do have this mechanic where you can speed up, just like Slither.io. And when you do this, you actually lay down a trail. But like Agar.io, it's going to actually take your mass from your creature or blob or whatever. It's going to take your mass away. So you need to do this specifically to trap other people. Once they have been trapped and they have eaten your traps and they kind of explode, then you can eat other people and then their energies and regrow. So instead of splitting, you actually have the mechanics of Slither.io, which I really like. The game seems to be a lot faster and at the same time still has that sort of like a trappish, sort of sneakity snaky sort of gameplay like Slither.io, but it's straightforward like Agar.io. So it's, it's kind of right in between those two games. And while not too explosive with originality, it's still just highly polished and a pretty interesting game. Okay, so now we're going to start getting into some pretty weird territory. We have Narwhale.io. Narwhale is unlike the previous three where they had varying degrees of intensity. Uh, you know, they're more slower paced though. Narwhale is like 
instantaneously ham from the get-go. You're going berserk. You're a narwhal and you're trying to pierce the booties of other narwhales. And doing this gives you random power-ups and boosts so that you can pierce better, faster, and stronger, and harder. And okay, this is awkward with no context, but narwhal is actually really, really fun. If you want to just literally jump in and go just absolute insanity from the very beginning, go one, 0 to 100% uh, in one second. Narwhal is that game. Then again, it's very, very hard to survive and actually, you know, really participate in the game. Some people like the slower gameplay, so maybe this isn't for everyone, but it's at least worth trying. It doesn't take much time at all to really get into it. Now, coming off the explosivity of Narwhal, I want to talk about Wings.io, which is actually a very similar concept. Flying around, but instead of piercing, you get lots of weapons, guns, your planes, and you're shooting other planes. But you still have, like, the randomness, you have the speed, you have the intensity, you have all these different ways of killing people and power-ups and craziness, and yeah, you know, it's, it's still just as explosive as Narwhal. It doesn't last as long, but it is super fun just to jump in and have a hoop and a holler, and, uh, see, actually, if you're, if you really like games that are very mechanically intensive, which generally Agar and Slither and Limax, those aren't. Wings.io is really going to push your aiming skills, your strategy, your tactics, maybe not so much, but mechanically, it's freaking intense. And the next game I want to talk about is a game called Tank Wars. Tank Wars is just like it uh, sounds like. You spawn just like any other IO game, and it's just free for all, or there might be uh, team deathmatch game modes, but you spawn instead of as a blob or as some shape, killing other shapes and devouring other shapes, you are a tank and you are shooting other tanks. Uh, but the cool thing is that they add this sort of detail to the game, so it's not just the minimalist art style, and maybe you like that, maybe you don't, and we're seeing more IO games, you know, incorporate stuff like this, more detail graphically, but Tank Wars, it's still simplistic, but it does add a little bit more detail you actually play as tanks shooting other tanks and the game plays pretty freaking fast you get into the action pretty quickly but instead of it being as intuitive as a gar like it just follows the mouse pointer this game you actually have to keep in mind the orientation of your tank and where you are aiming and everyone else's orientation where they're aiming and their momentum you also have different abilities like the vacuum and call in air strikes and get to actually pick up pickups it's pretty cool the game is fast and furious but overall it's definitely a breath of fresh air from the minimalist and simple games that we are used to in io but still at the same time it's not too in depth it's not too ridiculous all at once another game for the list is going to be a game called terr.io terr.io the full game is actually called territories and essentially this is an early access game that allows you to make territories i mean it's played just like a normal io game you spawn in into sort of like an mmo map into a lobby and you're trying to get bigger but the difference is it's not really you trying to get bigger it's not really you trying to evolve it's more like you're focusing on actually sort of making a territory for yourself an outline sort of a home a nice little place a little, a little nook into the mmo space into the lobby where you can exist and other people are going to want to try to encroach into your territory so you're, it's basically like a coloring game you're coloring a territory and if somebody comes onto your colors you run into them to destroy them and you try to take over other people's areas other people's territories it's really really simple it really is but at the same time there's a lot of depth and strategy and i could see this game going places especially with team base and right now there is no customization with the character or the lines or anything but maybe later on we'll have customization with colors and stuff like that i really can't wait to see where this game could go right now super bare bones but those bones are looking pretty good and next up on the list, we have a game called Wilds.io. Wilds is essentially a melee combat free-for-all MMO thing. You run around, there are different classes you can pick from, but you just basically run around and smack other people. There are teams and stuff, but there's a couple of elements to the game that makes it very interesting, even without the really cool pixel art, the upgrade graphics from, well, at least the minimalistic shapes that we are used to, but uh, you have items that you can actually pick up and throw at other enemies. You do have sort of a mature sort of aesthetic to the game as as well and overall it's very fast-paced action-packed and they even add a little bit of dimension because you can actually jump and you do have certain abilities like I said with the pickups and the items like bombs and pick up swords and throw swords and stuff and you also have this sort of kind of creep element to the game where instead of running and mining certain resources that are stagnant or actually chasing down different shapes it's more like the shapes are chasing you you actually have these little minions these creeps that run towards you and try to kill you so there is a PvE element in this PvP game other than just farming like we're used to in a gar type game Personally, I'd love to see more classes, more progression, more items, more mayhem, but the core of this game is absolutely solid, and that's why it's on this top 10 list.
And the next one on the list, we have Slash.io, and the slash is spelled with a four, guys, for the A, so keep that in mind, type that in, SL4SH.io, and you're gonna have some fun. Now, this game requires really good reflexes, okay? It's pretty fast, pretty furious. Now, in ways, okay? Like, when you actually get into combat, it's really intense. It's not floaty, like, agar in any way. It's not slow-paced. It's extremely fast-paced because you're literally darting, dashing, and slashing back and forth. It's a very agile game, but at the same time, its pace is actually longer and slower because you actually grow. I mean, not in size. You're not slowly just eating little orbs and then, you know, slowly eating other players. It's more like you are actually dashing and darting around, uh, killing these other shapes and then consuming these little orbs, whatever. You're, you're just eating things and then you can actually gain attributes. So at the very beginning of the game, you do get to choose classes, which is pretty cool, uh, you know, a way to start out so that it's a little bit different. You get a little bit of uniquity with that compared to, you know, games like Agar. Uh, but then as you play the game, you also get attributes. You know, you can get more health, more damage, more speed, better vision, stuff like that. Now, you don't evolve classes, so you're just kind of stuck with the one at the very beginning, but in the end, it's still a pretty cool. It's definitely a step up, in my opinion, and it changes the game around. And now my number one for IO game, all right? It's gonna be deep. Now, IO. D I E P. IO. In fact, I spent so much time on this game recently that I had to include it in my top 10 most played free to play list over at freemmostation.com. Absolutely, this is one of the best free to play games I've ever played. This is absolutely the game that inspired me to make this list. And in fact, it's like the game that got me to explore this whole genre, got me to explore and appreciate everything that this game has to offer, that the genre has to offer. And I'm really excited to see where things go from here next year and the years to come with browser based games and specifically this very niche genre, which I don't know if it's even niche anymore because it's pretty freaking popular. Thank you so much, Father Agar. But Deep.io is the next generation. So Deep, you play as a blob, of course, and you're shooting other shapes. So you're actually shooting to consume and level up, but you do level up, you do have attributes. But since it's a shooting game, you actually can attribute, you know, attributes. <laughs> you can actually change the way your projectiles work. And one thing that really makes this game Deep is the fact that you evolve your class actually changes you can choose and branch out different classes as you play the game so yeah you can uh, get more health you can get more speed uh, you can change your bullet reload speed or bullet speed itself bullet damage all that cool stuff yeah but you also change functionally how you actually play the game by either uh, evolving into like a twin shot into a triple shot into having a flank cannon into having a sniper cannon a sniper shot there's all sorts of different guns and barrels that you can choose from by leveling up and branching out your classes and that makes the game extremely fun. Games like this, which is all about leveling up, which is all about progression, this game gives you the most fluidity with that progression. It gives you the most amount of customization. It's extremely fun, fast paced whenever you're in combat because it's kind of like a bullet hell, but at the same time it gives you that customizable pace so that you can just, you know, you can slowly kind of farm up or you can go ham from the very beginning and go full on assassin. And everything in between. You want to go flamethrower build? Maybe you could do that. Hey, you could even do melee. And this game also incorporates physics. So like whenever you shoot a bullet, it pushes you a little bit so you can go fast reload speed and then go high melee damage and then shoot behind you so that you get extra speed to run into people the game is just super deep that's why i've been spending a lot of time on it that's why i've been having a lot of fun i can't wait to see where the genre goes from here but for now i'm kind of just stuck deep inside deep.io Thanks so much for watching, friends. These games are truly, honestly, really just fun browser games. They're great. Anybody can jump in and play for as long as they want, then get as hardcore as they want, or you can be as casual as you'd like it. For a game, let's jump in and play. Stay if you want to, or leave whenever you want to. It's the best. It epitomizes browser-based gameplay. I really enjoy this genre of game, and I put Agarda.io in my, you know, top 10 best browser games, and I really wanted to mention, you know, the clones and put a whole list for just these kind of games, because honestly, they deserve it. They're fun, and even though they seem simple, on the surface, there's actually a lot of depth to them when you actually start and play them for just a little bit. Have fun, friends. These are all fast and free games. Jump in, the water's fine. My name's Skylight. Stay tuned for more Top 10s, and I'll see you again next time. What's going on, friends and family? My name is Skylint, and today I'm going to give you my Top 10 list for the upcoming best free-to-play shooters. That could be first-person shooter, that can be third-person shooter. They just gotta be free, and you just gotta be shooting other players. That's pretty much it. Yeah, so here's 10 games that hopefully you didn't know about. Let's actually play a little game here. If you learned at least one new game from this list, like you didn't know of its existence, hey, hey, now you do, maybe you're excited for it, then go ahead and give the video a like. And if you've known all these games all along, and I'm, I don't know, you think I'm a loser, go ahead and dislike the video. However, I think that this stuff is gonna kinda blow you away with a little bit of the originality with some of these titles. Hopefully. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking.
I got a weird mix of games on this list. Hopefully you appreciate that. Now these are free, easy to just try. Some of them you can actually try right now and play. They're brand new, you can jump in. And some of them actually we don't even have gameplay for. However, I did my research. I played all that I could of these games and I did my research as much as I could on the games that are upcoming. And I think that there's gonna be something special. Trust me guys, watch the video, enjoy, and hopefully you see something new. All right, friends and family, starting off the list, we're gonna be talking about a game called First Assault Ghost in the Shell. And in my opinion, even though it is a free to play shooter, as in like, it is pretty standard. Like you guys remember Combat Arms, Ava, maybe Counter-Strike Next on Zombies, you know, stuff like that. There's like a certain quality or degree of polish that generally follows these kind of games. First Assault doesn't really exceed that too much, but it does, I would have to say, exceed it a little bit. Kind of. Uh, so it's a little bit above the cut, and also at the same time, it might seem like a cash grab for Ghost in the Shell, especially because it came out around the time the movie was coming out, but I think in the end, it's kind of cool, actually. I mean, there's a lot of customization with the weapons itself, with the characters. Uh, the characters themselves are like, it's kind of like a hero shooter, so there are abilities, and overall, like the physics, the map design, uh, just the way the game feels, it's definitely reminiscent of some older free-to-play shooters. But in the end, uh, you play these kind of games for their little good gimmicky game modes. I know some could be competitive, but First Assault has a couple of game modes that I think are really fun, especially with the heroes and everything. And I actually really appreciate the one game mode. There's like actually two predators and they run around while everyone else is invisible and they try to melee you down. I don't know, that seems really exciting to me. I love a cat and mouse style of game mode. So actually uh, for a couple of reasons and mainly that, I'm gonna put it at number 10. First Assault, Ghost in the Shell. All right, yeah, we'll kick it off the wall here. We're gonna be talking about a game that's totally opposite. Uh, it's a game called Snipers vs. Thieves. And I've been really honestly looking for an excuse to talk more about this game and film it and just play it and share it. This is probably the only FPS that I would recommend on mobile devices. Now, the gimmick here is that it's four players versus one. One is the sniper, and the other fours are thieves. And you might be wondering, Sky, seriously, really an FPS on mobile devices? And I'm telling you right now that the only legitimate one that I've ever played, and I play a lot of them because I'm weird like that, right? Snipers versus thieves actually makes me hype. Blood boils, hair stands on end, I get excited. This is a cool game. And I know, you touch controls for aiming. All you gotta do is aim. I, there's gadgets and, and weird stuff happening. And the thieves go on somewhat predictable paths. There are different lanes they can duck in and out of. There's some strategy and stuff there. Mainly focus on strategy, but for a, an FPS on mobile devices where you shoot other players, all the other ones, I mean, they try, but I feel like Snipers vs. Thieves does its own thing and it absolutely, uncontestedly succeeds. Okay, boys and girls, let's duck back into usual territory. You guys probably saw this coming a mile away. Battleborn just recently went free to play. Now, I normally don't like putting re-releases on these lists. In fact, you're not gonna see any of the re-releases of games like, you know, Combat Arms Reloaded. None of that, no. All wholly original that I can, but this is a little bit different. Some people might even consider Battleborn's initial launch as actually early access. Uh, technically, they do call you guys founders if you bought the game, so... Eh. Anyways, if you wanna try out Battleborn, it is free now. It's called a trial, but it's totally a free-to-play multiplayer game. And honestly, it's one of the most weird freaking games out there. It's like half FPS, half MOBA, and definitely it's not gonna be, you know, a game for everybody. But it's something that I think everyone should at least try once, because it's one of those games that I think if you get hooked, you're on. So while maybe uh, some people might compare it to some other titles, you know, a little bit of Overwatch, it actually mechanically feels like a totally different game, and I think this is one that you should not let pass you by. Yeah, well next up we have a game that I very much doubt you let pass you by. It's a game called Unturned, and really just quickly and cleanly, all I can say about Unturned is that it simply works. There are so many games in this genre, you know, these server survival games, or specifically zombie survival, that they just promise so much and they just don't deliver. And Unturned is just this childish looking game. It's very unassuming, but when you actually get in, you notice, even if you're a fan of the genre, play all these other games, it just simply works. It's one of those games that you can just pick up and go. Uh, you can actually just get a cosmetics added on for $5. You unlock cosmetics uh, customization there, which is pretty cool. Other than that, it's a completely free game. You can use co-op servers, you can go PvP servers. There's just PvP servers, uh, it takes away the zombies, but there's a couple of different ways you can play the game, and all in all, just the game itself is just pretty much fun for the whole family. Yeah, at the same time, even though it is kind of childish and cartoony, you know, with its aesthetic, I still feel like it gives you that fight or flight feeling that you would get in other survival games. So it's great. I think it's a great introduction to the whole genre. It might actually be one of the better. Maybe some people might say, uh, okay, I'll say, I think it's the best in the genre. Yeah, it's early access. It's been there for a little bit, but honestly, uh, pretty much every other game's been in there longer and this game just has more features that actually work. 
which is why I love it and why it's on the list. But now it's time we talk about a game called Gigantic. This is a third person shooter MOBA thing. In a lot of ways, it's not uh, like a standard MOBA. It's not quite like Battleborn, which is kind of half and half, half shooter, half MOBA. Gigantic's more like one fourth MOBA and the rest is third person shooter. You do have these branching ability trees. Whenever you level up, you can choose an ability modification, which is pretty freaking awesome, okay? So you got a lot of decent customization with your characters. But aside from that, there's no like itemization and there's not really towers or creeps kind of in a way. It's more like the objectives are like these giant massive creeps that you have to make class and fight over each other while you're duking it out against the other team. All I want to say is that while it does have MOBA elements, first and foremost, it feels like an incredibly hardcore shooter. Now, I'm somebody who plays a lot of arena shooters. I play a lot of weird games, like from Tribes Ascend, Quake Champions, new games, you know, all sorts of different crazy stuff, right? Lawbreakers and also MOBAs. And Gigantic feels like a crazy hard um, MOBA to understand because like the, just the, the way the branching leveling works seems like there's some good depth there without being overly complicated with items But it's shooting mechanics entwined with that as well pretty pretty hard to aim in this game pretty hard to aim uh, There is a whole lot of movement mobility uh, the animation quality is amazing in this game by the way whenever you are jumping all over the place it's just like, it feels like an arena shooter. You know, the first time you ever played Quake, the first time you ever played Unreal, you know, one of those games. It just kind of feels bigger, faster, uh, more epic. And, uh, you know, that entwined with some of the MOBA mechanics, you know, the explosivity of abilities and magic and a mix of melee characters and ranged. It's just all over the place. And yes, you will be missing some melee attacks because the game moves that fast and quickly. So even as a melee character, it feels like a third person shooter. I greatly appreciate Gigantic and I really hope for the best for this game. It actually comes out incredibly soon and shortly. I really hope you give it a chance. All right, next up we've got Paladins. And instead of me just being like another top 10 person and just kind of explaining, you know, the cliff notes, the bullet point list, the Wikipedia page of what a game is like Paladins, you probably already know. We know, we all play it, or generally we uh, know of the game and have played it at least once. But I'm here gonna use this time to actually explain why you should play it. And I'm gonna do it in probably the most toxic and harsh way because that's who I am. These top 10s are kind of like mini reviews anyways. So my mini review on Paladins, here we go. I mainly play Overwatch. I play a lot of Overwatch. It's my most played game in the past two years. And I've played it since beta. However, I am a fan of, of really a fanatic of the entire hero shooter genre. I like MOBAs, I like anything that uses characters, and I love first person shooters. I played them competitively for like ever. And Paladins really fits in between of all my interests, but it really does closely resemble Overwatch. So you would think, of course, I would just side with the premium product, which I do over and over again. I have to admit that Overwatch does some fucking things amazing, okay? Really great. But Paladins does some very specific things really good too. The flanking class and characters in this game and the way the maps are designed to open up more flanking routes is just phenomenal. It's great, I love it. It still has that structure, you know, capture points and everything, but the flanking is just ridiculous. And then because of that atmosphere of all these flanking and people flying around all over the place, really, Paladins has very low cooldowns generally. Uh, the game just becomes really fast paced, really chaotic, and then you add in like the customization of all the characters, and everybody is just flipping and flopping all around. It feels like a really awesome party game that also has a competitive edge. Though, Overwatch definitely is built from the ground up to be a competitive game, I feel like Paladins, kind of from top down, you know, it's meant to be just fun and silly first, and then from there. That's kind of high res's mentality, they just kind of throw a bunch of stuff, really it's kind of... Honestly, it's quantity over quality, but that's because they trust themselves to later if something doesn't stick You know, they can do some weird radical ideas and then they can fine-tune it Which they have done historically with smite all the different games and paladins They fine-tune it refine it and then you've seen what smite has done now You see what paladins is doing. It's not even released yet And that's why I cover it more than overwatch despite me right here saying I do play overwatch more but I'll cover Paladins more, I'll stream it more, and overall, I'll play with you guys more. Just because Paladins, it's almost hard to explain, but basically I could just say, it is stupid fun. I don't care how you compare it or contrast it, in the end, it's all about the game feel. And Paladins, in a lot of ways, it is rough around the edges, but it also, depending on what you do, depending on your bias, of course, it does feel pretty good. And yeah, that's probably Paladins' biggest critic saying, you should probably play Paladins. 
Next up on our list of upcoming free-to-play shooters, let's talk about Unreal Tournament. Now, Unreal Tournament was a very interesting concept here whenever they released it as free-to-play, or it's it's super early access, but keep that in mind. But the, the development of this game is, is a little bit more weird than just early access. See, it's not like you pay for early access. It's not like really you just play the game either. It's not like pretend early access. Unreal Tournament is really rough around the edges, especially for a game that's supposed to be like hyper competitive. An arena shooter, Unreal freaking Tournament. It's really more like made for players and by players at the same time. Now, Unreal Tournament is also entwined with the Unreal Engine 4, which is, mm, I mean, more or less, it's it's kind of easy to get in and it kind of makes, you know, mod it up a little bit if you kind of know what you're doing. It, it, you know, it's no Unity or no Game Maker, but still. Uh, intertwining that with Unreal Tournament means that more people are going to be able to make more weird game modes, potentially maps and stuff like that. And that's really optimistic uh, sounding, I guess. But in the end, the development is pretty slow. I, I have to mention that the player base is pretty small, mainly probably because it's uh, trying to appeal to the hardcore crowd, but at the same time trying to appeal to people who want to do a lot of silly stuff with custom game modes and things like that. So if we can get this game into a state where it kind of encompasses all of that at the same time a little bit more, you know, start building that esports scene, start tightening up the control controls and the graphics and everything so that we can start doing proper competitions and at the same time, you know, having fun lobbies and doing silly stuff. I would really appreciate that. It's not quite at that level, you know, it's an upcoming list, but I you can play the game now. Just know that this is more of a work versus play kind of thing at this, you know, particular moment. But still, if you're a fan of the series or the genre, which is absolutely waning, I can't contest that. Even though I love it, it definitely, Arena Shooters, not super popular, but Unreal Tournament looks to be doing good by me. Next up on the list, we have a game called Midair. I don't know if you've heard of this. Hopefully this is one of those uh, hidden gems that you didn't know. But Midair is essentially Tribes Ascend or the answer to Tribes Ascend. It looks a little bit more clean and cartoon. Maybe that's going to appeal to a wider audience. But if you've never played a Tribes game or Tribes-like game, which there really isn't many aside from the actual Tribes series, uh, think of an arena shooter, except not in a small arena, but like in a blown out epic giant sort of fields, uh, you know, just a giant map, okay? Uh, maybe battlefield size, except you're like flying through the air and you're like, you have this ski mechanic, which is super awesome. I really love the momentum mechanics. And you're like rocket jumping and propulsing yourself all through the air. And that's why the game's called Midair, because you're going to be shooting people in the air and doing ridiculous acrobatics all over the place. Capture the flags, the main game mode. Midair is basically saying, admitting that Tribes was a cool idea, but let's do it right and let's do right by the players. So hopefully it's going to focus on the competitive nature and at the same time, we're going to have a lot of servers and a lot of openness and ease of access to get in the game and play casually. I played on both sides and I actually my YouTube channel started really doing a lot of Tribes content very seriously. Uh, so I can actually attribute Tribes to my career now. I really enjoyed the game. I think it's something that uh, is basically just doesn't exist in any other game series. So that midair's coming, hopefully it answers our prayers and uh, hopefully it does good by us now. So I'll give it a chance. Hopefully you do too. Yeah, moving up the list pretty quick here. Maybe not. It's Keystone. Keystone. What do I know about Keystone? Almost nothing. Actually, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Basically, it kind of looks like a uh, kind of a hero shooter, but it seems got like this retro, almost like sci-fi aesthetic uh, where it's, you know, like back in the day, there was like they, they imagined what the future would look like. And they had all those sci-fi shows and horror shows and stuff like that. It's kind of like that kind of a state. It's like retro future, retro future, retro, whatever. Anyways, Keystone, it's actually by Digital Extremes, the makers of Warframe. And I'm just going to quickly say this. I wish instead of making this that you actually took the Warframe PvP very seriously because there's really nothing else like that aside from the previous, you know, historic guns the duel so yeah i would prefer that but i guess keystone could work out i mean warframe is a pretty polished product except for its net code so i'm gonna be looking out for that keystone as soon as i get access if you would please give me a key i'll just know i'm gonna be extremely critical about your net code just like it was at warframe but you know it's still extremely exciting i fucking love hero shooters which is why most of them are on this list Yeah, and we're finally at number one here. That's going to be Quake Champions. I've actually streamed this a good little bit. I've done some videos. If you want to see my review on it, do it. Or my reviews on anything else. I've actually reviewed uh, Reflex Arena. That was a pretty neato arena shooter. I, I like arena shooters, but like, let's be honest, guys. Arena shooters are in a great spot. I was a little hesitant actually talking about Unreal Tournament, actually, in this same video. But Quake Champions, let me just say this. It's three-fourths Quake and one-fourth champions. The champions are cool. I like hero shooters, but the reason it's on this list and so high is because I feel that Quake Champions had to rebuild the throne that used to exist 
previously held by itself, Quake, the Quake series, and then sat itself down to become the champion again, once again, for the arena shooter genre, which was so waning, which was so falling and flailing. And there's some other games that have come out. Toxic, Reflex, like I said, I did a review on that. And Quake Champions, which I did a review, did first impressions, did streams, did lots of videos. And for some reason, I played all these other games and a lot of hero shooters, but Quake Champions is the one that just kind of gets my blood boiling. It's to the point where I want to actually apply id software. I really want to see this game go places, at least as a free to play game, you know, with its monetization and somebody who's reviewed freaking professionally free to play games, MMOs, shooters, whatever, for five years. I have to say, I love the monetization. The renting is more fair than, oh my God, so many, basically all free to play shooters. And overall, I just like the game, man. I just, I just want to gush about it, but you guys know what it is. It's Quake, it's a classic, Rockets, Gib, it's beautiful, right? Arenas jumping all over the place, but now with champions, don't worry, they, they don't, it's not too crazy. You know, one ability, a few passives, it's still Quake, baby. It's fucking awesome. I'm glad the champion's back. Thanks for watching to the end of the list. Now, again, I just want to ask if you've seen something new here, then please give it a like. And again, if you have seen all of these before this video, then go ahead and dislike. Just let me know, man. I'm just trying to make the best content that I can. This whole channel is about trying new stuff, sharing new experiences together as a community. And in saying that, yeah, this top 10 is a community event. The comments below, let me know if there's anything at all that I missed that you want to give a shout out. But these are the 10 that I'm shouting out here pretty loud. Hopefully you know how I feel about them, why I'm excited, and why I think you should play them. But in the end, guys, whatever game you pick, I just hope that you have fun. My name's Skylint, and I'll see you in the next one.